Here we go. It is Tucker Carlson interviewing Vladimir Putin. Boy, he got a lot of flack for this. Personally, just as neutral from a POV as possible, I'm really excited to see what Putin has to say. I'm pretty excited about this. I, it, you know, we haven't had this kind of coverage. So let's take a peek at this. And as expected, we are going to go through and comment on it. Let's get started. No, y'all have sound? Oops, sorry, sorry, my bad. Hold on one second. No sound, okay, I'll fix that, one sec. Stand by, stand by, that's my bad. I screwed up. Oh, that's right, here we go. This should work. What? No sound still? Are you serious? Uh, come on, man. I never have problems with this. How? I can't be right. That had to have had sound. What is going on, kiddos? Hold on. Audio check. Oh, I figured it out. My bad. Sorry. I figured it out. It was my fault. It was, it was StreamYard. My setting on StreamYard. Okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah, well, what are you gonna do? Just take me a second here. Oh my lord. Wow. <laughs> Stand by. This is uh, quite annoying. I don't know what's going on. You know what? It's, it's, it's somebody, it's, I think it's Hillary Clinton, folks. She, she's, she's hacked my computer. Stand by. We're gonna do it, we're gonna pull it off. This should work now. The following is an interview with the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, shot February 6, 2024 at about 7 p.m. in the building behind us, which is, of course, the Kremlin. The interview, as you will see if you watch it, is primarily about the war in progress, the war in Ukraine, how it started, what's happening, and most pressingly, how it might end. One note before you watch. At the beginning of the interview, we asked the most obvious question, which is, why did you do this? Did you feel a threat, an imminent physical threat? Yeah. And that's your justification. And the answer we got shocked us. Putin went on for a very long time, probably half an hour, about the history of Russia going back to the 8th century. And honestly, we thought this was a filibustering technique and found it annoying and interrupted him several times. And he responded he was annoyed uh, by the interruption. But we concluded in the end, for what it's worth, <laughs> that it was not a filibustering technique. There was no time limit on the interview. We ended it after more than two hours. Instead, what you're about to see seemed to us sincere, whether you agree with it or not. Vladimir Putin believes that Russia has a historic claim to parts of Western Ukraine. So our opinion would be to view it in that light as a sincere expression of what he thinks. And with that, here it is. Mr. President, thank you. On February 22nd, 2022, you addressed your country in a nationwide address when the conflict in Ukraine started. And you said that you were acting because you had come to the conclusion that the United States, through NATO, might initiate a, quote, surprise attack on our country. And to American ears, that sounds paranoid. Tell us why you believe the United States might strike Russia out of the blue. How did you conclude that? It's not that America, the United States, was going to launch a surprise strike on Russia. I didn't say that. <coughs> Let's look where our relationship with Ukraine started from. Where did Ukraine come from? The Russian state started gathering itself as a centralized statehood, and it is considered to be the year of the establishment of the Russian state in 862, when the townspeople of Novgorod invited a Varangian prince, Rurik, from Scandinavia to reign. 
In 1862, Russia celebrated the 1,000th anniversary of its statehood. And in Novgorod, there is a memorial dedicated to the 1,000th anniversary of the country. In 882, Rurik's successor, Prince Oleg, who was actually playing the role of regent at Rurik's young son, because Rurik had died by that time, came to Kiev. He ousted two brothers, who apparently had once been members of Rurik's squad. So Russia began to develop with two centers of power, <coughs> Kiev and Novgorod. The next very significant date in the history of Russia was 988. This was the baptism of Russia when Prince Vladimir, the great-grandson of Rurik, baptized Russia and adopted Orthodoxy, or Eastern Christianity. From this time, the centralized Russian state began to strengthen. Why? Because of the single territory, integrated economic ties, one and the same language and, after the baptism of Russia, the same faith and rule of the prince. The centralized Russian state began to take shape. Back in the Middle Ages, Prince Yaroslav the Wise introduced the order of succession to a throne. But after he passed away, it became complicated for various reasons. The throne was passed not directly from father to eldest son, but from the prince, who had passed away to his brother, then to his sons in different lines. All this led to the fragmentation and the end of Rus as a single state. Just a really quick note, 988 is when the baptism of Russia was. So I just want you to know for context, this is going back over a thousand years, okay? So just know where that is. There was nothing special about it. The same was happening then in Europe. But the fragmented Russian state became an easy prey to the empire created earlier by Genghis Khan. His successors, namely Batu Khan, came to Rus, plundered and ruined nearly all the cities. The southern part, including Kiev, by the way, and some other cities simply lost independence, while northern cities preserved some of their sovereignty. They had to pay tribute to the horde, but they managed to preserve some part of their sovereignty. And then a unified Russian state began to take shape with its center in Moscow. The southern part of Russian lands, including Kiev, began to gradually gravitate towards another magnet, the center that was emerging in Europe. This was the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. It was even called the Lithuanian Russian Duchy, because Russians were a significant part of this population. They spoke the old Russian language and were Orthodox. But then there was a unification, the union of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Kingdom of Poland. A few years later, another union was signed, but this time already in the religious sphere. Quickly, the Mongol invasion of the Rus was in 1223, so we kind of jump forward about 220 years there. Some of the Orthodox priests became subordinate to the Pope. Thus, these lands became part of the Polish-Lithuanian state. During decades, the Poles were engaged in Polonization of this part of the population. They introduced their language there, tried to entrench the idea that this population was not exactly Russians, that because they lived on the fringe, they were Ukrainians. Originally, the word Ukrainian meant that the person was living on the outskirts of the state, along the fringes, or was engaged in a border patrol service. It didn't mean any particular ethnic group. So the Poles were trying to 
in every possible way to polonize this part of the Russian lands and actually treated it rather harshly, not to say cruelly. All that led to the fact that this part of the Russian lands began to struggle for their rights. They wrote letters to Warsaw demanding that their rights be observed and people be commissioned here, including to Kiev. I beg your pardon, can you tell us what period, I'm losing track of where in history we are, the, the, the Polish oppression of Ukraine? It was in the 13th century. Yeah, we're at 1400s. Now I will tell you what happened later and give the dates so that there is no confusion. And in 1654, even a bit earlier, the people who were in control of the authority over that part of the Russian lands addressed Warsaw, I repeat, demanding that they send them to rulers of Russian origin and Orthodox faith. When Warsaw did not answer them and in fact rejected their demands, they turned to Moscow so that Moscow took them away. Pew Research Group says that 94% of Polish today see Russia as a threat. So worth noting that difference since he's talking about the 1400s. So that you don't think that I'm inventing things. I'll give you these documents. Well, I, I, it doesn't sound like you're inventing it. I'm not sure why it's relevant to what happened two years ago. But still, these are documents from the archives, copies. Here are the letters from Bogdan Khmelnytsky, the man who then controlled the power in this part of the Russian lands that is now called Ukraine. He wrote to Warsaw demanding that their rights be upheld. And after being refused, he began to write letters to Moscow asking to take them under the strong hand of the Moscow Tsar. There are copies of these documents. I will leave them for your good memory. There is a translation into Russian, you can translate it into English later. Russia would not agree to admit them straight away, assuming that the war with Poland would start. Nevertheless, in 1654, the pan-Russian assembly of top clergy and landowners headed by the Tsar, which was the representative body of the power of the old Russian state, decided to include a part of the old Russian lands into Moscow Kingdom. As expected, the war with Poland began. It lasted 13 years and then in 1654 a truce was concluded. And 32 years later, I think, a peace treaty with Poland, which they called Eternal Peace, was signed. And these lands, the whole left bank of Dnieper, including Kiev, went to Russia. And the whole right bank of Dnieper remained in Poland. Under the rule of Katharina the Great, Russia reclaimed all of its historical lands, including in the south and west. This all lasted until the revolution. Before World War I, Austrian general staff relied on the ideas of Ukrainianization and started actively promoting the ideas of Ukraine and the Ukrainianization. Their motive was obvious. Just before World War I, they wanted to weaken the potential enemy and secure themselves favorable conditions in the border area. So the idea which had emerged in Poland that people residing in that territory were allegedly not really Russians, but rather belonged to a special ethnic group, Ukrainians, started being propagated by the Austrian general staff. As far back as the 19th century, theorists calling for Ukrainian independence appeared. All those, however, claimed that Ukraine should have a very good relationship with Russia. They insisted on that. After the 1917 revolution, the Bolsheviks sought to restore the statehood and the civil war began.
including the hostilities with Poland. In 1921, peace with Poland was proclaimed, and under that treaty, the right bank of Dnieper River once again was given back to Poland. I'm going to super quickly show you a map, just so you can really see it. I think it's going to be really helpful for you. Poland, right here, I mean, you could just see, this is just Apple Maps right here. Here's Poland. There's Warsaw, we heard that mentioned, capital of uh, Poland, okay? Here, the Dnipro is the lower portion of Kiev here. Okay, and then you have the Dnipro lowlands on the right, and then the disputed territories that are right here, like for example, Donetsk, right? This is where you have a lot of fighting, and then of course you have Crimea, uh, Crimea, Sevastopol. Just to help you get a picture of this, I think that's very critical to understand this. Okay, here we go. In 1939, after Poland cooperated with Hitler, he did collaborate with Hitler, you know. <coughs> Hitler offered Poland peace and a treaty of friendship, an alliance demanding in return that Poland give back to Germany the so-called Danzig Corridor, which connected the bulk of Germany with East Prussia and Königsberg. After World War I, this territory was transferred to Poland, and instead of Danzig, a city of Dansk emerged. Hitler asked them to give it amicably, but they refused. Of course. Still, they collaborated with Hitler and engaged together in the partitioning of Czechoslovakia. But may, may I ask you, you're making the case that, that Ukraine, certainly parts of Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine is in, in effect Russia has been for hundreds of years. Why wouldn't you just take it when you became president 24 years ago? You have nuclear weapons, they don't. If it's actually your land, why did you wait so long? Sure. I'll tell you. I'm coming to that. This briefing is coming to an end. It might be boring, but it explains many things. You just don't know how it's relevant. Good. Good. I'm so gratified that you appreciate that. Thank you. So, before World War II, Poland collaborated with Hitler, and although it did not yield to Hitler's demands, it still participated in the partitioning of Czechoslovakia together with Hitler. As the Poles had not given the Danzig Corridor to Germany, it went too far, pushing Hitler to start World War II by attacking them. Why was it Poland against whom the war started on 1st September 1939? Poland turned out to be uncompromising and Hitler had nothing to do but start implementing his plans with Poland. By the way, the USSR, I have read some archive documents, behaved very honestly. It asked Poland's permission to transit its troops through the Polish territory to help Czechoslovakia. But the then Polish foreign minister said that if the Soviet plans flew over Poland, they would be downed over the territory of Poland. <coughs> but that doesn't matter. What matters is that the war began, and Poland fell prey to the policies it had pursued against Czechoslovakia, as under the well-known Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Part of the territory, including Western Ukraine, was to be given to Russia. Thus, Russia, which was then named the USSR, regained its historical lands. After the victory in the Great Patriotic War, as we call World War II, all those territories were ultimately enshrined as belonging to Russia, to the USSR. As for Poland, it received, apparently in compensation, the lands which had originally been German. The eastern parts of Germany, these are now western lands of Poland. Of course, Poland regained access to the Baltic Sea and Danzig, which was once again given its Polish name. So, this was how this situation developed. 
really worth noting, a massive animosity even in Germany still exists today between people who live in Western Germany and Eastern Germany. I was born in Germany and I saw that my entire life. It still exists today. And there's also that animosity between Germans and Poles. Some, you know, not, not newer generations now. In 1922, when the USSR was being established, the Bolsheviks started building the USSR and established the Soviet Ukraine, which had never existed before. Right. Stalin insisted that those republics be included in the USSR as autonomous entities. For some inexplicable reason, Lenin, the founder of the Soviet state, insisted that they be entitled to withdraw from the USSR. <clears throat> and again, for some unknown reasons, he transferred to that newly established Soviet Republic of Ukraine some of the lands together with people living there, even though those lands had never been called Ukraine. And yet, they were made part of that Soviet Republic of Ukraine. Those lands included the Black Sea region, which was received under Catherine the Great, and which had no historical connection with Ukraine whatsoever. Even if we go as far back as 1654, when these lands returned to Russian Empire, that territory was the size of three to four regions of modern Ukraine, with no Black Sea region. That was completely out of the question. In 1654? Exactly. Well, I'm just, I, you obviously have encyclopedic knowledge of this region, but why didn't you make this case for the first 22 years as president that Ukraine wasn't a real country? Quickly, I, I don't think that Putin is saying that. I think Putin is saying that Putin thinks Lenin made a mistake granting autonomy to the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks were considered a, a group of individuals that had uh, uh, strong aspirations of being autonomously governed, uh, having independence, uh, and, and that there would, would is an idea that Ukraine would be better independent. That is the opinion of Lenin. It appears that Putin disagrees with that opinion, but let's see. Ukraine получила... The Soviet Union was given a great deal of territory that had never belonged to it, including the Black Sea region. At some point, when Russia received them as an outcome of the Russo-Turkish Wars, they were called New Russia or Novorossiya. But that does not matter. What matters is that Lenin, the founder of the Soviet state, established Ukraine that way. For decades, the Ukrainian Soviet Republic developed as part of the USSR. And for unknown reasons, again, the Bolsheviks were engaged in Ukrainianization. It was not merely because the Soviet leadership was composed to a great extent of those originating from Ukraine. Rather, it was explained by the general policy of indigenous Indigenization pursued by the Soviet Union. Same things were done in other Soviet republics. This involved promoting national languages and national cultures, which is not a bad in principle. That is how the Soviet Ukraine was created. After the World War II, Ukraine received, in addition to the lands that had belonged to Poland before the war, part of the lands that had previously belonged to Hungary and Romania. So Romania and Hungary had some of their lands taken away and given to the Soviet Ukraine, and they still remain part of Ukraine. So in this sense, we have every reason to affirm that Ukraine is an artificial state that was shaped at Stalin's will. Do you believe Hungary has a right to take its land back from Ukraine and that other nations have a right to go back to their 1654 <coughs> borders? I'm not sure whether they should go back to the 1654 borders. But given Stalin's time, so-called Stalin's regime, which as many claim saw numerous violations of human rights and violations of the rights of other states, one may say that they could claim back those lands of theirs while having no right to do that. It is at least understandable. Have you told Viktor Orban that he can have part of Ukraine? 
Never. I have never told him. Not a single time. <coughs> we have not even had any conversation on that, but I actually know for sure that Hungarians who live there wanted to get back to their historical land. Moreover, I would like to share a very interesting story with you. I digress, it's a personal one. Somewhere in the early 80s, I went on a road trip in a car from then Leningrad across the Soviet Union through Kiev. Made a stop in Kiev and then went to western Ukraine. I went to the town of Beregovoye. And all the names of towns and villages there were in Russian and in a language I did not understand, in Hungarian in Russian and in Hungarian, not in Ukrainian, in Russian and in Hungarian. I was driving through some kind of village and there were men sitting next to the houses and they were wearing black three-piece suits and black cylinder hats. I asked, are they some kind of entertainers? I was told, no, they were not entertainers, they are Hungarians. I said, what are they doing here? What do you mean? This is their land, they live here. This was during the Soviet time in the 1980s. They preserved the Hungarian language, Hungarian names and all their national costumes. Keep in mind, Hungarians are the third largest minority group in Ukraine, well, at least pre the war. They are Hungarians and they feel themselves to be Hungarians. And of course, when now there is an infringement. Well, that, that is, and there's a lot of that though. I think many nations that are upset about Transylvania as well, as you obviously know. But many nations feel frustrated by the redrawn borders of the wars of the 20th century and wars going back a thousand years, the ones that you mentioned. But the fact is that you didn't make this case in public until two years ago, February. And in the case that you made, which I read today, you, you explain at great length that you felt a physical threat from the West in NATO, including potentially a nuclear threat, and that's what got you okay. to move. Is that a fair character? Tucker has been trying to get to this point for like 30 minutes now. He's been trying to get to, were you afraid of the US? Why did you invade? So far, it's been a 30 minute history lesson. And in fairness, Tucker did give us a heads up. We were gonna sit through 30 minutes of history. Let's see what happens. Characterization of what you said? I understand that my long speeches probably fall outside of the genre of the interview. That is why I asked you at the beginning, are we going to have a serious talk or a show? You said a serious talk. So bear with me, please. We are coming to the point where the Soviet Ukraine was established. Then, in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. And everything that Russia had generously bestowed on Ukraine was dragged away by the latter. I'm coming to a very important point of today's agenda. Thank you. After all, the collapse of the Soviet Union was effectively initiated by the Russian leadership. I do not understand what the Russian leadership was guided by at the time, but I suspect there were several reasons to think everything would be fine. First, I think that then Russian leadership believed that the fundamentals of the relationship between Russia and Ukraine were, in fact, a common language. More than 90% of the population there spoke Russian. Family ties. Every third person there had some kind of family or friendship ties. Common culture. Common history. Finally, common faith, coexistence with a single state for centuries, and deeply interconnected economies. All of these were so fundamental. All these elements together make our good relationships inevitable. The second point is a very important one. I want you, as an American citizen and your viewers, to hear about this as well. The former Russian leadership assumed that the Soviet Union had ceased to exist 
and therefore there were no longer any ideological dividing lines. Russia even agreed voluntarily and proactively to the collapse of the Soviet Union and believed that this would be understood by the so-called civilized West as an invitation for cooperation and association. That is what Russia was expecting, both from the United States and the so-called collective West as a whole. There were smart people, including in Germany, Egon Barr, a major politician of the Social Democratic Party, who insisted in his personal conversations with the Soviet leadership on the brink of the collapse of the Soviet Union, that a new security system should be established in Europe. Help should be given to unify Germany, but a new system should be also established to include the United States, Canada, Russia and other Central European countries. Yes. But NATO needs not to expand. That's what he said. If NATO expands, everything would be just the same as during the Cold War, only closer to Russia's borders. That's all. He was a wise old man, but no one listened to him. In fact, he got angry once. If, he said, you don't listen to me, I'm never setting my foot in Moscow once again. Everything happened just as he had said. Yeah, well, it, of course, it did come true, and I and you've mentioned this many times. I think it's a fair point, and many in America thought yeah. that relations between <clears throat> Russia and the United States would be fine with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. That the opposite happened, but you've never explained why you think that happened, except to say that the West fears a strong Russia, but we have a strong China. The West does not f seem very afraid of. This is going to be interesting because I think this is Tucker or sorry, this is Putin's opportunity to really distance himself, which he's already been setting up from the prior leadership in Russia. Be clear. He talks about the former Russian leadership being gone. We were open to cooperation. We generously gave land to Ukraine and the leadership sucked. Lenin screwed up. Look at how Putin is really separating himself from the history of Russia. Uh, this is really interesting. So I want to see where this is go. This goes. But if you're not caught up on that, think about that. I'm posting this all live blog on ehack.com, by the way. Uh, what about Russia? Do you think convinced policymakers they had to take it down? The West is afraid of strong China more than it fears a strong Russia. Because Russia has 150 million people and China has 1.5 billion population and its economy is growing by leaps and bounds, or 5% a year, it used to be even more. But that's enough for China. As Bismarck once put it, potentials are the most important. China's potential is enormous. It is the biggest economy in the world today in terms of purchasing power parity and the size of the economy. It has already overtaken the United States quite a long time ago, and it is growing at a rapid clip. Let's not talk about who is afraid of whom. Okay, let's be clear. China's growth rate may be exceeding the United States economy, but the United States economy is larger than China. Let's not reason in such terms. And let's get into the fact that after 1991, when Russia expected that it would be welcomed into the brotherly family of civilized nations, nothing like this happened. You tricked us. I don't mean you personally when I say you. Of course, I'm talking about the United States. The promise was that NATO would not expand eastward. But it happened five times. There were five waves of expansion. We tolerated all that. We were trying to persuade them. We were saying, please don't. We are as bourgeois now as you are. We are a market economy and there is no communist party power. Let's negotiate. Moreover, I have also said this publicly before. There was a moment when a certain rift started growing between us. Before that, Yeltsin came to the United States. Remember, he spoke in Congress and said the good words. God bless America. Everything he said were signals. Let us in. 
Remember the developments in Yugoslavia before the Yeltsin was lavished with praise? As soon as the developments in Yugoslavia started, he raised his voice in support of Serbs, and we couldn't but raise our voices for Serbs in their defense. I understand that there were complex processes on the way there, I do. But Russia could not help raising its voice in support of Serbs, because Serbs are also a special and close to us nation, with orthodox culture and so on. It's a nation that has suffered so much for generations. Well, regardless, what is important is that Yeltsin expressed his support. What did the United States do? In violation of international law and the UN Charter, it started bombing Belgrade. It was the United States that led the genie out of the bottle. Moreover, when Russia protested and expressed its resentment, what was said? The UN Charter and international law have become obsolete. Now everyone invokes international law, but at that time they started saying that everything was outdated, everything had to be changed. Indeed, some things need to be changed, as the balance of power has changed, it's true. But not in this manner. Yeltsin was immediately dragged through the mud, accused of alcoholism, of understanding nothing, of knowing nothing. He understood everything, I assure you. Well. I became president in 2000, I thought, okay, the Yugoslav issue is over, but we should try to restore relations. Let's reopen the door that Russia had tried to go through. And moreover, I said it publicly, I can reiterate. At a meeting here in the Kremlin with the outgoing president Bill Clinton, right here in the next room, I said to him, I asked him, Bill, do you think if Russia asked to join NATO, do you think it would happen? Suddenly he said, you know, it's interesting, I think so. But in the evening, when we met for dinner, he said, you know, I've talked to my team, no, no, it's not possible now. You can ask him, I think he will watch our interview, he'll confirm it. I wouldn't have said anything like that if it hadn't happened. Okay, Were well, you sincere? it's impossible now. Would you have joined NATO? Look, I asked the question, is it possible or not? And the answer I got was no. If I was insincere in my desire to find out what the leadership position was... But if he had said yes, would you have joined NATO? If he had said yes, the process of rapprochement would have commenced, and eventually it might have happened, if we had seen some sincere wish on the other side of our partners. But it didn't happen. Well, no means no. Okay, fine. Why do you think that is? Just to get to motive, I know you're clearly bitter about it, um, I understand. But why do you think the West rebuffed you then? Why the hostility? Why did the end of the Cold War not fix the relationship? What motivates this from your point of view? You said I was bitter about the answer. No, it's not bitterness. It's just a statement of fact. We're not bride and groom, bitterness, resentment. It's not about those kind of matters in such circumstances. We just realized we weren't welcome there, that's all. Okay, fine. But let's build relations in another manner. Let's work for common ground elsewhere. Why we received such a negative response, you should ask your leaders. I can only guess why. Too big a country with its own opinion and so on. And the United States, I have seen how issues are being resolved in NATO. I will give you another example now concerning Ukraine. The US leadership exerts pressure, and all NATO members obediently vote, even if they do not like something. Now, I'll tell you what happened in this regard with Ukraine in 2008, although it's being discussed. I'm not going to open a secret to you, say anything new. Nevertheless, after that we tried to build relations in different ways. For example, the events in the Middle East, in Iraq. We were building relations with the United States in a very soft, prudent, cautious manner. I repeatedly raised the issue that the United States should not support separatism or terrorism in the North Caucasus. But they continue to do it anyway. 
and political support, information support, financial support, even military support came from the United States and its satellites for terrorist groups in the Caucasus. I once raised this issue with my colleague, also the President of the United States. He says, it's impossible, do you have proof? I said, yes. I was prepared for this conversation and I gave him that proof. He looked at it and you know what he said? I apologize, but that's what happened. I'll quote. He says, well, I'm gonna kick their ass. We waited and waited for some response. There was no reply. I said to the FSB director, write to the CIA, what is the result of the conversation with president? He wrote once, twice, and then we got a reply. We have the answer in the archive. The CIA replied, we have been working with the opposition in Russia, we believe that this is the right thing to do, and we will keep on doing it. Just ridiculous. Well. That's a very interesting and big allegation here. Keep in mind what he just said. He just suggested that the CIA responded to the intelligence agency of Russia and said, hey, sorry, you know, we don't agree with what y'all are doing in Russia, so we're supporting your opposition. And Putin is arguing, hey, the U.S. shouldn't be supporting and choosing separatist groups here. Like, we, we are a free market economy. We should be negotiating. Keep in mind, obviously, this is Putin's POV. Okay. We realized that it was out of the question. Forces in opposition to you. So you're saying the CIA is trying to overthrow your government. Of course, they meant in that particular case the separatists, the terrorists who fought with us in the Caucasus. That's who they called the opposition. This is the second point. The third moment is a very important one is the moment when the U.S. missile defense system was created. The beginning. We persuaded for a long time not to do it in the United States. Moreover, after was invited by Bush Jr.'s father, Bush Sr., to visit his place on the ocean, I had a very serious conversation with President Bush and his team. I proposed that the United States, Russia and Europe jointly create a missile defense system that we believe, if created unilaterally, threatens our security, despite the fact that the United States officially said that it was being created against missile threats from Iran. That was the justification for the deployment of the missile defense system. I suggested working together, Russia, the United States and Europe. They said it was very interesting. They asked me, are you serious? I said, absolutely. May I ask, what year was this? I don't remember. It is easy to find out on the internet when I was in the USA at the invitation of a Bush senior. Oh, I, I can tell you, it was August of 2007. Putin did negotiate with Bush on a missile defense shield. And Bush, according to Reuters, actually called this very innovative. That's where relations were in 2007 between George W. Bush and Putin. Worth keeping that in mind. Putin's not wrong about this part that he's talking about. It is even easier to learn from someone I'm going to tell you about. I was told it was very interesting. I said, just imagine if we could tackle such a global strategic security challenge together. The world will change. We'll probably have disputes, probably economic and even political ones, but we could drastically change the situation in the world. He says yes, and asks, are you serious? I said, of course, we need to think about it, I'm told. I said, go ahead, please. Then Secretary of Defense Gates, former director of CIA and Secretary of State Rice came in here, in this cabinet, right here at this table. They sat on this table. Me, the foreign minister, the Russian defense minister on that side, they said to me, yes, we have thought about it, we agree. I said, thank God, great, but with some exceptions. So twice you've described U.S. presidents making decisions and then being undercut 
by their agency heads. So it sounds like you're describing a system that's not run by the people who are elected in your telling. That's right, that's right. In the end, they just told us to get lost. I'm not going to tell you the details because I think it's incorrect. After all, it was confidential conversation. But our proposal was declined, that's a fact. It was right then when I said, Look, but then we will be forced to take countermeasures. We will create such strike systems that will certainly overcome missile defense systems. The answer was, we are not doing this against you, and you do what you want, assuming that it is not against us, not against the United States. I said, okay. Very well. That's the way it went. And we created hypersonic systems with intercontinental range, and we continue to develop them. We are now ahead of everyone, the United States and the other countries, in terms of the development of hypersonic strike systems, and we are improving them every day. But it wasn't us. We proposed to go the other way and we were pushed back. Now, about NATO's expansion to the east. Well, we were promised no NATO to the east, not an inch to the east, as we were told. And then what? They said, well, it's not enshrined on paper, so we'll expand. So there were five waves of expansion, the Baltic states, the whole of Eastern Europe, and so on. And now I come to the main thing. They have come to the Ukraine, ultimately. In 2008, at the summit in Bucharest, they declared that the doors for Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO were open. Now about how decisions are made there. Germany, France seem to be against it, as well as some other European countries. But then, as it turned out, later President Bush, and he's such a tough guy, a tough politician, as I was told later, he exerted pressure on us and we had to agree. It's ridiculous, it's like kindergarten. Where are the guarantees? What kindergarten is this? What kind of people are these? Who are they? You see, they were pressed, they agreed. And then they say, Ukraine won't be in the NATO, you know? I say, I don't know. I know you agreed in 2008. Why won't you agree in the future? Well, they pressed us then. I say, why won't they press you tomorrow? And you'll agree again. Well, it's nonsensical. Who's there to talk to? I just don't understand. We're ready to talk. But with whom? Where are the guarantees? None. So they started to develop the territory of Ukraine. Whatever is there, I have told you the background, how this territory developed, what kind of relations there were with Russia. Every second or third person there has always had some ties with Russia. And during the elections in already independent, sovereign Ukraine, which gained its independence as a result of the Declaration of Independence, and by the way, it says that Ukraine is a neutral state, and in 2008, suddenly the doors or gates to NATO were open to it. Oh, come on. This is not how we agreed. Now, all the presidents that have come to power in Ukraine, they relied on electorate with a good attitude to Russia in one way or the other. This is the southeast of Ukraine. This is a large number of people. And it was very difficult to dissuade this electorate, which had a positive attitude towards Russia. Viktor Yanukovych came to power, and how? The first time he won after President Kuchma, they organized the third round, which is not provided for in the constitution of Ukraine. This is a coup d'etat. Just imagine, someone in the United States wouldn't like the outcome. In 2014? Before that. No, this was before that, after President Kuchma, Viktor Yanukovych won the elections. However, his opponents did not recognize that victory. The US supported the opposition and the third round was scheduled. What is this? Okay, quick, quick catch up because you might be a little confused by some of this. Putin's kind of bouncing around a little bit. Really quick, 2008, this is after George Bush and Putin were talking missile deal, okay? 2008, Kosovo declares independence from Serbia. Serbia and Russia are like, hey, we're cool. And the US is like, well, we're gonna side with Kosovo. And Russia's like, yo, what the hell? 
And then at a NATO summit in Bucharest, NATO essentially with the United States supports giving Ukraine and Georgia a membership action plan to joining NATO. Uh, and that's what Putin is referring to. So if you're uh, confused by that, that gives you a little bit of more color and catch up. Remember earlier, he suggested that NATO feels like it's just sort of a puppet of the United States and it does whatever the United States wants. Okay, let's keep going. Full summary so far, ehack.com. This is a coup. The U.S. supported it and the winner of the third round came to power. Imagine if in the U.S. something was not to someone's liking and the third round of election, which the U.S. Constitution does not provide for, was organized. Nonetheless, it was done in Ukraine. Okay, Viktor Yushchenko, who was considered a pro-Western politician, came to power. Fine, we have built relations with him as well. He came to Moscow with visits. We visited Kiev. I visited Sioux. We met in an informal setting. If he's pro-Western, so be it. It's fine. Let people do their job. The situation should have developed inside independent Ukraine itself. As a result of Kuchma's leadership, things got worse and Viktor Yanukovych came to power after all. Maybe he wasn't the best president and politician. I don't know. I don't want to give assessments. However, the issue of the association with the EU came up. We have always been lenient to this, suit yourself. But when we read through the Treaty of Association, it turned out to be a problem for us, since we had a free trade zone and open customs borders with Ukraine, which under this association had to open its borders for Europe, which could have led to flooding of our market. We said, no, this is not going to work. We shall close our borders with Ukraine then. The customs borders, that is. Yanukovych started to calculate how much Ukraine was going to gain, how much to lose, and said to his European partners, I need more time to think before signing. The moment he said that, the opposition began to take destructive steps which were supported by the West. It all came down to Maidan and a coup in Ukraine. So he did more trade with Russia than with the EU. Ukraine did. Of course. It's not even the matter of trade volume, although for the most part it is. It is the matter of cooperation ties, which the entire Ukrainian economy was based on. The cooperation ties between the enterprises were very close since the times of the Soviet Union. One enterprise there used to produce components to be assembled both in Russia and Ukraine and vice versa. They used to be very close ties. A coup d'etat was committed, although I shall not delve into details now, as I find doing it inappropriate, the US told us. Calm Yanukovych down and we will calm the opposition. Let the situation unfold in the scenario of a political settlement. We said all right. Agreed. Let's do it this way. As the Americans requested, Yanukovych did use neither the armed forces nor the police, yet the armed opposition committed a coup in Kiev. What is that supposed to mean? Who do you think you are? I wanted to ask the then US leadership. With the backing of whom? With the backing of CIA, of course. The organization you wanted to join back in the day, as I understand. We should thank God they didn't let you in. Although, it is a serious organization. I understand. My former vis-a-vis -vis in the sense that I served in the first main directorate. Tucker didn't like that call out, okay? It, like, there, if, if you Google this, it, you know, t apparently Tucker Carlson tried to join the CIA, but his application was denied. And then he went into journalism. Tucker did not like that at all. <laughs> Soviet Union's intelligence service. They have always been our opponents. A job is a job. No, technically, they did everything right. Technically, they did everything right. They achieved their goal of changing the government. However, from a political standpoint, it was a colossal mistake. Surely, it was political leadership's miscalculation. They should have seen what it would evolve into. 
So, in 2008, the doors of NATO were opened for Ukraine. In 2014, there was a coup, they started persecuting those who did not accept the coup, and it was indeed a coup. They created a threat to Crimea, which we had to take under our protection. They launched the war in Donbas in 2014 with the use of aircraft and artillery against civilians. This is when it all started. There is a video of aircraft attacking Donetsk from above. They launched a large-scale military operation, then another one. When they failed, they started to prepare the next one. All this against the background of military development of this territory and opening of NATO's doors. How could we not express concern over what was happening? From our side, this would have been a culpable negligence. That's what it would have been. It's just that the US political leadership pushed us to the line we could not cross, because doing so could have ruined Russia itself. Besides, we could not leave our brothers in faith, in fact, a part of Russian people, in the face of this war machine. What was the, so, but that was eight years before the current conflict started. So what was the trigger for you? What was the moment where you decided you had to do this? Initially, it was the coup in Ukraine that provoked the conflict. By the way, back then the representatives of three European countries, Germany, Poland and France, arrived. They were the guarantors of the signed agreement between the government of Yanukovych and the opposition. They signed it as guarantors. Despite the Keep in mind for a second what Putin just said. He just said that they took Crimea to protect Crimea. Now, Russian forces did occupy Crimea in 2014 to quell protests. During that time, the Republic of Crimea was formed. That declared independence from Ukraine, which was undergoing its coup. And then Russia annexed the new Republic of Crimea. A little bit of background. That the opposition committed a coup and all these countries pretended that they didn't remember that they were guarantors of the peaceful settlement. They just threw it in the stove right away and nobody recalls that. I don't know if the US know anything about the agreement between the opposition and the authorities and its three guarantors who, instead of bringing this whole situation back in the political field, supported the coup. Although it was meaningless, believe me. Because President Yanukovych agreed to all conditions, he was ready to hold an early election which he had no chance of winning, frankly speaking. Everyone knew that. Then why the coup? Why the victims? Why threatening Crimea? Why launching an operation in Donbas? This I do not understand. That is exactly what the miscalculation is. CIA did its job to complete the coup. I think one of the deputy secretaries of state said that it cost a large sum of money, almost five billion. But the political mistake was colossal. Why would they have to do that? All this could have been done legally, without victims, without military action without losing Crimea. We would have never considered to even lift a finger if it hadn't been for the bloody developments on Maidan. Because we agreed with the fact that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, our borders should be along the borders of former Union's republics. We agreed to that. But we never agreed to NATO's expansion and, moreover, we never agreed that Ukraine would be in NATO. We did not agree to NATO bases there without any discussion with us. For decades we kept asking, don't do this, don't do that. And what triggered the latest events? Firstly, the current Ukrainian leadership declared that it would not implement the Minsk agreements, which had been signed, as you know, after the events of 2014 in Minsk 
where the plan of peaceful settlement in Donbas was set forth. But no, the current Ukrainian leadership, foreign minister, all other officials and then president himself said that they don't like anything about the Minsk agreements. In other words, they were not going to implement it. A year or a year and a half ago, former leaders of Germany and France said openly to the whole world that they indeed signed the Minsk agreements, but they never intended to implement them. They simply led us by the nose. Was there anyone for you to talk to? Did you call a U.S. President's Secretary of State and say, if you keep militarizing Ukraine with NATO forces, this is going to get, this is going to be a, we're going to act. We talked about this all the time. We addressed the United States and European countries' leadership to stop these developments immediately, to implement the Minsk agreements. Frankly speaking, I didn't know how we were going to do this, but I was ready to implement them. The hey, quick, quick note there. That's a big line. When he says, I was ready to implement them, well, let's see how he continues here, but Ukraine has responded to the allegation of Putin saying, hey, you're not applying the Minsk agreements. Uh, Ukraine has responded with, hey, well, Russia's not implementing it, so you guys do it first. And Putin did just say, we were ready to implement it. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. These agreements were complicated for Ukraine. They included lots of elements of those Donbass territories independence. That's true. However, I was absolutely confident, and I'm saying this to you now, I honestly believe that if we manage to convince the residents of Donbass, and we had to work hard to convince them to return to the Ukrainian statehood, then gradually the wounds would start to heal. When this part of territory reintegrated itself into common social environment, when the pensions and social benefits were paid again, all the pieces would gradually fall into place. No, nobody wanted that. Everybody wanted to resolve the issue by military force only. But we could not let that happen. And the situation got to the point when the Ukrainian side announced, no, we will not do anything. They also started preparing for military action. It was they who started the war in 2014. Our goal is to stop this war. And we did not start this war in 2022. This is an attempt to stop it. Do you think you've stopped it now? I mean, have you achieved your aims? No, we haven't achieved our aims yet, because one of them is the Nazification. This means the prohibition of all kinds of neo-Nazi movements. This is one of the problems that we discussed during the negotiation process, which ended in Istanbul early this year. And it was not our initiative, because we were told by the Europeans, in particular, that it was necessary to create conditions for the final signing of the documents. My counterparts in France and Germany said, how can you imagine them signing a treaty with a gun to their heads? The troops should be pulled back from Kiev. I said, all right, we withdrew the troops from Kiev. Ooh, that's an interesting line. Okay, wait a minute. There is a very strong Ukrainian argument uh, that has been made, and obviously think about your, this uh, yourself. There's a strong Ukrainian argument made that with the support of US and uh, European weapons, the Ukrainians repelled Russia out of Ukraine, or out of Kiev, right? And Putin right now is saying, we chose to leave Kiev. Interesting. As soon as we pulled back our troops from Kiev, our Ukrainian negotiators immediately threw all our agreements reached in Istanbul into the bin and got prepared for a long-standing armed confrontation with the help of the United States and its satellites in Europe. That is how the situation has developed. And that is how it looks now. 
But, <laughs> but what is, pardon my ignorance, what is denazification? What would that mean? What is... Yeah, what I just want to say about this. It's a very important question. Denazification. That is what I want to talk about right now. It is a very important issue. Denazification. After gaining independence, Ukraine began to search, as some Western analysts say, its identity. And it came up with nothing better than to build this identity upon some false heroes who collaborated with Hitler. I have already said that in the early 19th century, when the theorists of independence and sovereignty of Ukraine appeared, they assumed that an independent Ukraine should have very good relations with Russia. But due to the historical development, those territories were part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Poland, where Ukrainians were persecuted and treated quite brutally as well as were subject to cruel behavior. There were also attempts to destroy their identity. All this remained in the memory of the people. When World War II broke out, part of this extremely nationalist elite collaborated with Hitler believing that he would bring them freedom. The German troops, even the SS troops, made Hitler's collaborators do the dirtiest work of exterminating the Polish and Jewish population. Hence this brutal massacre of the Polish and Jewish population, as well as the Russian population too. This was led by the persons who are well known, Bandera, Shukevich. It was those people who were made national heroes, that is the problem. And we are constantly told that nationalism and neo-Nazism exist in other countries as well. Yes, they are seedlings, but we approve them, and other countries fight against them. But Ukraine is not the case. These people have been made into national heroes in Ukraine. Monuments to those people have been erected. They are displayed on flags. Their names are shouted by crowds that walk with torches, as it was in Nazi Germany. These were people who exterminated Poles, Jews and Russians. It is necessary to stop this practice and prevent the dissemination of this concept. I say that Ukrainians are part of the one Russian people. They say, no, we are a separate people. Okay, fine. If they consider themselves a separate people, they have the right to do so, but not on the basis of Nazism, the Nazi ideology. Would you be satisfied with the territory that you have now? I will finish answering the question. You just asked the question about neo-Nazism and denazification. Look, the president of Ukraine visited Canada. This story is well known, but being silenced in the Western countries. The Canadian parliament introduced a man who, as the speaker of the parliament said, fought against the Russians during the World War II. Well, who fought against the Russians during the World War II? Hitler and his accomplices. It turned out that this man served in the SS troops. He personally killed Russians, Poles and Jews. The SS troops consisted of Ukrainian nationalists who did this dirty work. The president of Ukraine stood up with the entire parliament of Canada and applauded this man. How can this be imagined? The president of Ukraine himself, by the way, is a Jew by nationality. Re really, my question is, what do you do about it? I mean, Hitler's been dead for 80 years, Nazi Germany no longer exists. And so, true. And so, I think what you're saying is you want to extinguish or at least control Ukrainian nationalism, but how? How do you do that? Look, listen to me. Your question is very 
tonki. Listen to me. Your question is very subtle. And I can tell you what I think. Do not take offense. Of course. This question appears to be subtle. It is quite pesky. You say Hitler has been dead for so many years, 80 years. But his example lives on. People who exterminated Jews, Russians and Poles are alive. And the president, the current president of today's Ukraine, applauds him in the Canadian parliament, gives a standing ovation. Can we say that we have completely uprooted this ideology if what we see is happening today? That is what denazification is in our understanding. We have to get rid of those people who maintain this concept and support this practice and try to preserve it. That is what denazification is. That is what we mean. Right. My question was a little more specific. It was, of course, not a defense of Nazis, neo or otherwise. It was a practical question. You don't control the entire country. You don't control Kiev. You don't seem like you want to. So how, how do you eliminate a culture or an ideology or feelings or a view of history in a country that you don't control. What do you do about that? You know, as strange as it may seem to you, during the negotiations in Istanbul, we did agree that we have it all in writing. Neo-Nazism would not be cultivated in Ukraine, including that it would be prohibited at the legislative level. Mr. Carson, we agreed on that. This, it turns out, can be done during the negotiation process. And there's nothing humiliating for Ukraine as a modern civilized state. Is any state allowed to promote Nazism? It is not, is it? Uh, that is it. Um, will there be talks and why haven't there been talks about resolving the conflict in Ukraine? On talks, we're going to keep going in a moment. I got to catch up a couple things. Okay, yes, Ukraine does have a history of collaborating with Hitler. That is true. There are individuals who have statues, historic Ukrainian individuals, who had ties to Hitler, who have statues still in Ukraine. That is true. About 56 to 140,000 Jews currently live in Ukraine. That is true. So far, Putin has not answered the question about would you be satisfied with the territory you have now. Then Putin says, hey, there are still proponents of Nazism today. Consider Zelensky giving a standing ovation to a Nazi in the Canadian Parliament. Okay, this is also true, but the purpose of that speech was for unification. Putin saw that, though, as supporting Nazism. This person, Yaroslav Hunka, was somebody who worked for the German Waffenschutzstaffel. That's the German SS. And yes, people in Parliament did stand to clap for that person who fought for the Nazis. I think that's important detail. Let's keep going. Ukraine peace talks. They have been. They reached a very high stage of coordination of positions in a complex process, but still they were almost finalized. But after we withdrew our troops from Kiev, as I have already said, the other side threw away all these agreements and obeyed the instructions of Western countries, European countries and the United States to fight Russia to the bitter end. Moreover, the president of Ukraine has legislated a ban on negotiating with Russia. He signed a decree forbidding everyone to negotiate with Russia. But how are we going to negotiate if he forbade himself and everyone to do this? We know that he is putting forward some ideas about this settlement. But in order to agree on something, we need to have a dialogue. Is that not right? Well, but you wouldn't be speaking to the Ukrainian president, you'd be speaking to the American president. When was the last time you spoke to Joe Biden? I cannot remember when I talked to him. I do not remember. We can look it up. You don't remember? No. Why? Do I have to remember everything? I have my own things to do, 
We have domestic political affairs. Well, he's funding the war that you're fighting, so I would think that would be memorable. Well, yes, he funds, but I talked to him before the special military operation, of course. And I said to him then, by the way, I will not go into details, I never do, but I said to him then, I believe that you are making a huge mistake of historic proportions by supporting everything that is happening there, in Ukraine, by pushing Russia away. I told him, told him repeatedly, by the way. I think that would be correct if I stop here. What did he say? Ask him, please. It is easier for you, you are a citizen of the United States. Go and ask him. It is not appropriate for me to comment on our conversation. But, but, but you haven't spoken to him since before February of 2022? No, we haven't spoken. Certain contacts are being maintained, though. Speaking of which, do you remember what I told you about my proposal to work together on a missile defense system? That was with Bush. Yes. You can ask all of them. All of them are safe and sound, thank God. The former president, Condoleezza, is safe and sound. And I think Mr. Gates and the current director of the intelligence agency, Mr. Burns, the then ambassador to Russia, in my opinion, are very yes. successful ambassador. They were all witnesses to these conversations. Ask them. Same here. If you are interested in what Mr. President Biden responded to me, ask him. At any rate, I talked to him about it. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely interested, but from the outside, it seems like this could devolve or evolve into something that brings the entire world into conflict and could um, initiate some, a nuclear launch. And so why don't you just call Biden and say, let's work this out? What's there to work out? It's very simple. I repeat, we have contacts through various agencies. I will tell you what we are saying on this matter and what we are conveying to the U.S. leadership. If you really want to stop fighting, you need to stop supplying weapons. It will be over within a few weeks. That's it. And then we can agree on some terms. Before you do that, stop. What's easier? Why would I call him? What should I talk to him about? Or beg him for what? And, and what messages do you get back? You're going to deliver such and such weapons to Ukraine? Oh, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, please don't. What is there to talk about? Do you think NATO is worried about this becoming a global war or a nuclear conflict? At least that's what they're talking about. And they're trying to intimidate their own population with an imaginary Russian threat. This is an obvious fact. And thinking people, not Philistines, but thinking people, Analysts, those who are engaged in real politics, just smart people, understand perfectly well that this is a fake. They are trying to fuel the Russian threat. The threat I think you're referring to is a Russian invasion of Poland, Latvia, expansionist. Well, not just that, but also the whole World War III narrative that Russia has nukes and therefore we have to fight Russia to keep them weak, which is basically it's a proxy war against Russia, right? We fund and supply Ukrainians. Ukrainian people give their lives to keep Russia essentially distracted or weak or crippled or whatever. And the idea is, therefore, Americans will be safe. That's the idea, right? It's it's much more than just Poland. It's it's the West. Behavior is, can you imagine a scenario where you sent Russian troops to Poland? Only in one case, if Poland attacks Russia. Why? Because we have no interest in Poland, Latvia or anywhere else. Why would we do that? We simply don't have any interest. It's just threat mongering. And a global war will bring all humanity to the brink of destruction. It's obvious. Sounds reasonable. There are certainly means of deterrence. They have been scaring everyone with us all along. 
Tomorrow Russia will use tactical nuclear weapons. Tomorrow Russia will use that. No, the day after tomorrow. So what? In order to extort additional money from US taxpayers and European taxpayers in the confrontation with Russia in the Ukrainian theater of war. The goal is to weaken Russia as much as possible. One of uh, our senior United States senators from the state of New York, Chuck Schumer, said yesterday, I believe, that we have to continue to fund the Ukrainian effort or U.S. soldiers, citizens could wind up fighting there. How do you assess that? Yeah, so far, this is reiterating exactly what we said, essentially proxy war on the idea of they're going to use strategic nukes. It's interesting to see that actually all play out here in this discussion. This is fascinating. It's getting good now. This is a provocation and a cheap provocation at that. I do not understand why American soldiers should fight in Ukraine. There are mercenaries from the United States there. The bigger number of mercenaries comes from Poland, with mercenaries from the United States in second place and mercenaries from Georgia in third place. Well, if somebody has the desire to send regular troops, that would certainly bring humanity to the brink of very serious global conflict. This is obvious. Do the United States need this? What for? Thousands of miles away from your national territory. Don't you have anything better to do? You have issues on the border, issues with migration, issues with the national debt, more than 33 trillion dollars. You have nothing better to do, so you should fight in Ukraine? Wouldn't it be better to negotiate with Russia? make an agreement, already understanding the situation that is developing today, realizing that Russia will fight for its interests to the end, and realizing this, actually return to common sense, start respecting our country and its interests, and look for certain solutions. It seems to me that this is much smarter and more rational. Who blew up? This, by the way, is like such a burn on on uh, the American political regime today. Uh, he's kind of Putin's good. Like he's he's really good at sort of manipulating, uh, or or at least I should say explaining himself. Uh, you know, some things he's saying are right. Some things are a little stretched. Obviously, we know that. But let's just be clear and neutral about this. We, everybody in America is like, we have too much debt and we have a crisis at the border. Democrats believe that, Republicans believe that. He's taking a knife, putting it in that wound, and he's twisting it like an hour and a half into this. Smart. It's kind of like he got everybody interested and now he's starting to, to twist that knife. This is, this is pretty good. Nord Stream. <laughs> you for sure. Nord Stream. I was busy that day. <laughs> <laughs> Nate, it, do you have, do you have, uh, I did not blow up Nord Stream, uh, thank you though. <laughs> you personally may have an alibi, but the CIA has no such alibi. Do, do you have evidence that NATO or the CIA did it? You know, I won't get into details, but people always say in such cases, look for someone who is interested. But in this case, we should not only look for someone who is interested, but also for someone who has capabilities. Because there may be many people interested, but not all of them are capable of sinking to the bottom of the Baltic Sea and carrying out this explosion. These two components should be connected, who is interested and who is capable of doing it. But I'm confused. I mean, that's the biggest act of industrial terrorism ever, and it's the largest emission of CO2 in, in history. Okay, so if you had evidence, and presumably given your security services, your intel services, you would, that NATO, the US, CIA, the West did this, why wouldn't you present it and win a propaganda victory? <laughs> Good question. In the war of propaganda, it is very difficult to defeat the United States because the United States controls all the world's media and many European media. The ultimate beneficiary of the biggest European media are American financial institutions. Don't you know that? 
So it is possible to get involved in this work, but it is cost prohibitive, so to speak. We can simply shine the spotlight on our sources of information and we will not achieve results. It is clear to the whole world what happened and even American analysts talk about it directly. It's true. Yes. I, but, but here's a question you may be able to answer. You worked in Germany, famously. Um, the Germans clearly know that their NATO partner did this, but they, and it damaged their economy greatly. It may never recover. Why are they being silent about it? That's very confusing to me. Why wouldn't the Germans say something about it? This also confuses me. But today's German leadership is guided by the interests of the collective West rather than its national interests. Otherwise, it is difficult to explain the logic of their action or inaction. After all, it is not only about Nord Stream 1, which was blown up, and the Nord Stream 2 was damaged. But one pipe is safe and sound, and gas can be supplied to Europe through it. But Germany does not open it. We are ready, please. There is another route through Poland, called Yamal Europe, which also allows for a large flow. Poland has closed it, but Poland packs from the German hand, it receives money from the pan-European funds, and Germany is the main donor to these pan-European funds. Germany feeds Poland to a certain extent, and they close their route to Germany. Why? I don't understand. Ukraine, to which the Germans supply weapons and give money. Germany is the second sponsor of the United States in terms of financial aid to Ukraine. There are two gas routes through Ukraine. They simply closed one route, the Ukrainians. Open the second route and please get gas from Russia. They do not open it. Why don't the Germans say? Look guys, we give you money and weapons, open up the valve, please, let the gas from Russia pass through for us. We are buying liquefied gas at exorbitant prices in Europe. Which brings the Quick note, Putin's right here. Pipe A of the Nord Stream 2 is inoperable. Pipe B is undamaged. The level of our competitiveness and economy in general down to zero. Do you want us to give you money? Let us have the decent existence, make money for our economy, because this is where the money we give you comes from. They refuse to do so. Why? Ask them. That is what is like in their heads. Those are highly incompetent people. Well, maybe the world is breaking into two hemispheres, one with cheap energy, the other without. And I want to ask you that. If, if we're now a multipolar world, obviously we are. Can you describe the blocks of alliances? Who, who is in each side, do you think? Listen, you have said that the world is breaking into two hemispheres. A human brain is divided into two hemispheres. One is responsible for one type of activities, the other one is more about creativity and so on. But it is still one and the same head. The world should be a single whole. Security should be shared rather than a meant for the golden billion. That is the only scenario where the world could be stable, sustainable and predictable. Until then, while the head is split in two parts, it is an illness, a serious adverse condition. It is a period of severe disease that the world is going through now. But I think that Thanks to honest journalism, this work is akin to work of the doctors. This could somehow be remedied. Well, let's just give one example, the, the US dollar, which has kind of united the world uh, in a lot of ways, maybe not to your advantage, but certainly to ours. Is that going away as the reserve currency, the, the common, the universe accept? Okay, here we go. We're getting into talk about BRICS, the dollar reserve currency. We got to talk about that. That's important. I just want to clarify the pipe issue really quickly. Okay, three of the pipes that were ruptured by the blasts, uh, two of them hit the Nord Stream 1, uh, and then one of the Nord Stream 2 pipelines were broken. One of them remains undamaged. Obviously, though, European countries have decided not to essentially quote-unquote subsidize Russia by buying natural gas from them or oil or otherwise. Okay, now... 
This is big, okay? This has to do with BRICS. This has to do with the dollar reserve currency status, uh, the petrodollar. Basically, we trade in dollars around the global international economy, specifically oil. There is this uprising of potentially um, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, okay? That would be the a BRICS potential currency. Remember, we kicked Russia out of the SWIFT interbanking messaging system, and they're like, yo, you're kicking us out of everything. Maybe it's time for a new currency, right? Okay, great. Let's get into it. Big currency, how have sanctions, do you think, changed the dollar's place? Oh, and quickly, there are huge articles in Foreign Affairs, Economist, and otherwise that say sanctions so far, economic sanctions, the SWIFT bans, everything, have basically done nothing to damage Ukraine. I wouldn't be surprised if Putin just laughs this off. In the world. You know, to use the dollar as a tool of foreign policy struggle is one of the biggest strategic mistakes made by the U.S. political leadership. The dollar is the cornerstone of the United States power. I think everyone understands very well that no matter how many dollars are printed, they are quickly dispersed all over the world. Yeah, true. Inflation in the United States is minimal. It's about 3 or 3.4%, 3 which is, I think, totally acceptable for the US. But they won't stop printing. What does the debt of $33 trillion tell us about? It is about the emission. Nevertheless, it is the main weapon used by the United States to preserve its power across the world. As soon as the political leadership decided to use the US dollar as a tool of political struggle, a blow was dealt to this American power. I would not like to use any strong language, but it is a stupid thing to do and a grave mistake. Look at what is going on in the world. Even the United States allies are now downsizing their dollar reserves. Seeing this, everyone starts looking for ways to protect themselves. But the fact that the United States applies restrictive measures to certain countries, such as placing restrictions on transactions, freezing assets, etc., causes great concern and sends a signal to the whole world. What did we have here? Until 2022, about 80% of Russian foreign trade transactions were made in US dollars and euros. Okay, quickly, there, there is some truth to this. Remember, Saudi Arabia did partner with China to start settling uh, uh, oil trades in the yuan instead of the dollar. We are seeing some of this sort of pullback and, and getting away from reliance on the dollar. We are seeing some of that. Uh, dollar is still supreme out of all of them, keeping in mind that also as the U.S. economy caps out on interest rates, what you'll probably see is the dollar actually fall unless the U.S. is the only country that stays out of recession and everybody else goes into recession, then the dollar could be the strongest loser, so to speak, out of all dollars. But Putin's not wrong here. The United States will not stop printing money. We won't have deflation in America because we're just going to keep making more dollars. That's just the game. It, it is a Ponzi. It's just the game that it is. So Putin's not wrong about that. U.S. dollars accounted for approximately 50% of our transactions with third countries. While currently it is down to 13%. It wasn't us who banned the use of the U.S. dollar. We had no such intention. It was decision of the United States to restrict our transactions in U.S. dollars. I think it is complete foolishness from the point of view of the interests of the United States itself and its taxpayers, as it damages the U.S. economy, undermines the power of the United States across the world. By the way, our transactions in Yuan accounted for about 3%. Today, 34% of our transactions are made in rubles and about as much, a little over 34% in yuan. 
Why did the United States do this? My only guess is self-conceit. They probably thought it would lead to full... Yuan quickly is Chinese. ...collapse, but nothing collapsed. Moreover, other countries, including oil producers, are thinking of and already accepting payments for oil in Yuan. Yeah. Do you even realize what is going on or not? Does anyone in the United States realize this? Well, let, let just be fair for a moment. Again, remember what I said about the US dollar being so supreme. Just quick, quick, quick little screenshot. Quick screenshot. US dollar is the blue line as a percentage of foreign currency reserves. Euro is the red line. US and Euro are allies. Okay, then you get to uh, the little green line down there. That's other. And then you got like the Japanese yen and the pound sterling like way at the bottom. So, yeah, the dollar is still pretty damn strong. What are you doing? You are cutting yourself off. All experts say this. Ask any intelligent and thinking person in the United States what the dollar means for the US. But you're killing it with your own hands. I think that's a fair, I, I think that's a fair <clears throat> assessment. The question is what comes next. And maybe you trade one colonial power for another much less sentimental and forgiving colonial power. I mean, are, is the, the, the BRICS, for example, in danger of being completely there dominated by the Chinese, the Chinese economy uh, in a way that's not good for their sovereignty? Do you worry about that? <laughs> Well, we have heard those boogeyman stories before. It is a boogeyman story. We're neighbors with China. You cannot choose neighbors just as you cannot choose close relatives. We share a border of thousand kilometers with them. This is number one. Second, we have a centuries-long history of coexistence. We're used to it. Third, China's foreign policy philosophy is not aggressive. Its idea is to always look for compromise, and we can see that. The next point is as follows. We are always told the same boogeyman story, and here it goes again, through an euphemistic form, but it is still the same boogeyman story. The cooperation with China keeps increasing. The pace at which China's cooperation with Europe is growing is higher and greater than that of the growth of Chinese-Russian cooperation. Ask Europeans, aren't they afraid? They might be, I don't know. But they are still trying to access China's market at all costs, especially now that they are facing economic problems. Chinese businesses are also exploring the European market. Do Chinese businesses have small presence in the United States? Yes, the political decisions are such that they are trying to limit their cooperation with China. It is to your own detriment, Mr. Tucker, that you are limiting cooperation with China. You are hurting yourself. It is a delicate matter, and there are no silver bullet solutions, just as it is with the dollar. So, before introducing any illegitimate sanctions, illegitimate in terms of the Charter of the United Nations, one should think very carefully. For decision makers, this appears to be a problem. So you said a moment ago that the world would be a lot better if it weren't broken into competing alliances, if there was cooperation globally. One of the reasons you don't have that is because the current American administration is dead set against you. Do you think if there were a new administration after Joe Biden that you would be able to re-establish communication with the U.S. government? Or does it not matter who the president is? I will tell you, but let me finish the previous thought. We, together with my colleague and friend, President Xi Jinping, set a goal to reach $200 billion of mutual trade with China this year. We have exceeded this level. According to our figures, our bilateral trade with China totals already 230 billion, and the Chinese statistics says it is 240 billion dollars. One more important thing, our trade is well balanced, mutually complementary in high tech, energy, scientific research and development. It is very balanced. 
As for BRICS, where Russia took over the presidency this year, the BRICS countries are, by and large, developing very rapidly. Look, if memory serves me right, back in 1992, the share of the G7 countries in the world economy amounted to 47%, whereas in 2022, it was down to, I think, a little over 30%. The BRICS countries accounted for only 16% in 1992, but now their share is greater than that of the G7. It has nothing to do with the events in Ukraine. This is due to the trends of global development and world economy, as I mentioned just now. And this is inevitable. This will keep happening. It is like the rise of the sun. You cannot prevent the sun from rising. You have to adapt to it. How do the United States adapt? With the help of force, sanctions, pressure, bombings, and use of armed forces. Uh, quickly, it's just worth mentioning, uh, we just heard Putin argue that the UN is illegitimate. Russia, the Russian Federation is part of the United Nations. Uh, clearly, he believes that it's mostly driven by the United States and therefore manipulated by the United States. One of the reasons, though, that they stay in the United Nations, this is important to know, one of the reasons Russia stays a member of the United Nations is because they are a chartered permanent five, it's called a P5, member of the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council, each member, each P5 member, has full veto power over what the United Nations Security Council can do. The five members are China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. So one of the reasons, in case you're wondering, well, why is Russia part of the UN if they think the UN is Ill illegitimate, is because they're part of the P5 and they have a permanent veto uh, to overrule anything the UN Security Council wants to do. This is about self-conceit. Your political establishment does not understand that the world is changing. By the way, I'm writing all of this down on ehack.com. The whole interview, I've just, I kind of write my notes on ehack and then I, I, I bring some stuff up here. Under objective circumstances. And in order to preserve your level, even if someone aspires, pardon me, to the level of dominance, you have to make the right decisions in a competent and timely manner. Such brutal actions, including with regard to Russia and, say, other countries, are counterproductive. This is an obvious fact. It has already become evident. You just asked me if another leader comes and changes something. It is not about the leader. It is not about the personality of a particular person. I had a very good relationship with, uh, say, Bush. I know that in the United States he was portrayed as some kind of a country boy who does not understand much. I assure you that this is not the case. I think he made a lot of mistakes with regard to Russia too. I told you about 2008 and the decision in Bucharest to open the NATO's doors to for Ukraine and so on. That happened during his presidency. He actually exercised pressure on the Europeans. But in general, on a personal human level, I had a very good relationship with him. Quickly, that's the reference to the 2008 Kosovo declaration when we had the independence between the two. Uh, and basically, the U.S. worked to give a path towards a, a membership to, the, uh, to NATO through the membership action plan. We touched on that earlier. He was no worse than any other American or Russian or European politician. I assure you, he understood what he was doing as well as others. I had such personal relationship with Trump as well. It is not about the personality of the leader, it is about the elite's mindset. If the idea of domination at any cost, based also on forceful actions, dominates the American society, nothing will change. It will only get worse. But if, in the end, one comes to the awareness that the world has been changing due to the objective circumstances and that one should be able to adapt to them in time, using the advantages that the U.S. still has today, then perhaps something may change.
Wow. Look, China's economy has become the first economy in the world in purchasing power parity. In terms of volume, it overtook the U.S. a long time ago. The USA comes second, then India, one and a half billion people, and then Japan, with Russia in the fifth place. Russia was the first economy in Europe last year, despite all the sanctions and restrictions. Is it normal from your point of view? Sanctions, restrictions, impossibility of payments in dollars, being cut off from SWIFT services, sanctions against our ships carrying oil, sanctions against airplanes, sanctions in everything, everywhere. The largest number of sanctions in the world which are applied are applied against Russia. And we have become Europe's first economy during this time. The tools that U.S. uses don't work. Well, one has to think about what to do. If this realization comes to the ruling elites, then yes, then the first person of the state will act in anticipation of what the voters and the people who make decisions at various levels expect from this person. Then maybe something will change. But you're describing two different systems. You say that the leader acts in the interest of the voters, but you also say these decisions are not made by the leader, they're made by the ruling classes. <coughs> You've run this country for so long, you known all these American presidents, what are those power centers in the United States, do you think? Like, who actually makes the decisions? <laughs> Wait a minute. That is a big, big, big question right there about is Biden actually running the government? Oh, I cannot wait to see Putin's response to this. Uh, quick pitch, I gotta throw it in there. Thank you so much for being 150,000 strong on this live stream. If you wanna subscribe and learn a whole lot more about me, either my startups or what we do at meetkevin.com or whatever, hit subscribe. I break down news here totally for free and at ehack.com. Love y'all, thank you for the support. Let's keep watching. I don't know. America is a complex country, conservative on one hand, rapidly changing on the other. It's not easy for us to sort it all out. Who makes decisions in the elections? Is it possible to understand this when each state has its own legislation? Each state regulates itself? Someone can be excluded from elections at the state level. It is a two-stage electoral system. It is very difficult for us to understand it. Certainly there are two parties that are dominant, the Republicans and the Democrats. And within this party system, the centers that make decisions, that prepare decisions. Then, look, why, in my opinion, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, such an erroneous, crude, completely unjustified policy of pressure was pursued against Russia? After all, this is a policy of pressure. NATO expansion, support for the separatists in Caucasus, creation of a missile defense system. These are all elements of pressure. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Then, dragging Ukraine into NATO is all about pressure, pressure, pressure. Why? I think among other things... Quick note, he kind of slid in a slam on what just happened with the Supreme Court today, where basically he's, what he's saying is, why is the Supreme Court even debating the fact that a state can just pick to take somebody off the ballot? That was his implication. I made a full breakdown of that uh, as well. You could watch that later. The things because excessive production capacities were created. During the confrontation with the Soviet Union, there were many centers created and specialists on the Soviet Union who could not do anything else. They convinced the political leadership that it is necessary to continue chiseling Russia, to try to break it up, to create on this territory several quasi-state entities and to subdue them in a divided form, to use their combined potential for the future struggle with China. This is a mistake, including the excessive potential of those who worked for the confrontation with the Soviet Union. It is necessary to get rid of this. There should be new, fresh forces, people who look into the future and understand what is happening in the world. Look at how Indonesia is developing. 600 million people. Where can we get away from that? Nowhere. We just have to assume that Indonesia will enter 
It is already in the club of the world's leading economies, no matter who likes it or dislikes it. Yes, we understand and are aware that in the United States, despite all the economic problems, the situation is still normal with the economy growing decently. The GDP is growing by 2.5%, if I'm not mistaken. But if we want to ensure the future, then we need to change our approach to what is changing. As I already said, the world would nevertheless change, regardless of how the developments in Ukraine end. The world is changing. In the United States themselves, experts are writing that the United States are nonetheless gradually changing their position in the world. It is your experts who write that. I just read them. The only question is how this would happen, painfully and quickly, or gently and gradually. And this is written by people who are not anti-American. They simply follow global development trends. That's it. And in order to assess them and change policies, we need people who think, look forward, can analyze and recommend certain decisions at the level of political leaders. I just have to ask, you've said clearly that NATO expansion <coughs> eastward is a violation of the promise you all were made in 1990. <coughs> it, it's a threat to your country. Right before you send troops into Ukraine, the Vice President of the United States went to the Munich Security Conference and encouraged the President of Ukraine to join NATO. Do you think that was an effort to provoke you into military action? I repeat once again, we have repeatedly, repeatedly proposed to seek a solution to the problems that arose in Ukraine after 2014 coup d'etat through peaceful means. But no one listened to us. And moreover, the Ukrainian leaders who were under the complete US control suddenly declared that they would not comply with the Minsk agreements. They disliked everything there and continued military activity in that territory. And in parallel, that territory was being exploited by NATO military structures under the guise of various personnel training and retraining centers. They essentially began to create bases there, that's all. Ukraine announced that the Russians were a non-titular nationality while passing the laws that limit the rights of non-titular nationalities in Ukraine. Ukraine, having received all these southeastern territories as a gift from the Russian people, suddenly announced that the Russians were a non-titular nationality in that territory. Is that normal? All this put together led to the decision to end the war that neo-Nazis started in Ukraine in 2014. Do you, do you think Zelensky has the freedom to negotiate a settlement <coughs> to this conflict? I don't know the details, of course, it's difficult for me to judge. But I believe he has, in any case, he used to have. His father fought against the fascists, Nazis, during World War II. I once talked to him about this. I said, Volodya, what are you doing? Why are you supporting neo-Nazis in Ukraine today, while your father fought against fascism? He was a frontline soldier. I will not tell you what he answered, this is a separate topic, and I think it's incorrect for me to do so. But as to the freedom of choice, why not? He came to power on the expectations of Ukrainian people that he would lead Ukraine to peace. He talked about this. It was thanks to this that he won the elections overwhelmingly. But then, when he came to power, in my opinion, he realized two things. Firstly, it is better not to clash with neo-Nazis and nationalists, because they are aggressive and very active. You can expect anything from them. And secondly, the US-led West supports them and will always support those who antagonize with Russia. It is beneficial and safe. So he took the relevant position despite promising his people to end the war in Ukraine. He deceived his voters. But do you think at this point, as of February 2024, he has the latitude, the freedom 
to speak with you or your government directly about putting an end to this, which clearly isn't helping his country or the world. Worth quickly noting, Putin here basically suggested, hey, it's easier for Zelensky to align with the U.S. and to like kind of turn a blind eye to neo-Nazis because that will keep him in power. That's what Putin is alleging of Zelensky. Can he do that, do you think? Why not? He considers himself head of state. He won the elections. Although we believe in Russia that the coup d'etat is the primary source of power for everything that happened after 2014. And in this sense, even today, government is flawed. But he considers himself the president and he is recognized by the United States, all of Europe and practically the rest of the world in such a capacity. Why not? He can. We negotiated with Ukraine in Istanbul. We agreed. He was aware of this. Moreover, the negotiation group leader, Mr. Arachamiya is his last name, I believe still heads the faction of the ruling party, the party of the president in the Rada. He still heads the presidential faction in the Rada, the country's parliament. He still sits there. He even put his preliminary signature on the document I am telling you about. But then he publicly stated to the whole world, we were ready to sign this document, but Mr. Johnson, then the Prime Minister of Great Britain, came and dissuaded us from doing this, saying it was better to fight Russia. They would give everything needed for us to return what was lost during the clashes with Russia. And we agreed with this proposal. Look, his statement has been published, he said it publicly. Can they return to this or not? The question is, do they want it or not? Further on, President of Ukraine issued a decree prohibiting negotiations with us. Let him cancel that decree, and that's it. We have never refused negotiations, indeed. We hear all the time, is Russia ready? Yes, we have not refused. It was them who publicly refused. Uh, keep in mind, Putin said in this very interview, he said, hey, I'll negotiate as soon as you stop supplying weapons. As soon as you, America, stop supplying weapons, this will be resolved in a few weeks, and then we can negotiate. So in the same interview, Putin is saying two different things. Keep that in mind. Well, let him cancel his decree and enter into negotiations. We have never refused. And the fact that they obeyed the demand or persuasion of Mr. Johnson, the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, seems ridiculous and very sad to me. Because, as Mr. Arakamiya put it, we could have stopped those hostilities with war a year and a half ago already. But the British persuaded us and we refused this. Where is Mr. Johnson now? And the war continues. That's a good question. Where do you think he is and why did he do that? Hell knows. I don't understand it myself. There was a general starting point. For some reason, everyone had the illusion that Russia could be defeated on the battlefield. Because of arrogance, because of a pure heart, but not because of a great mind. You've described uh, the connection between Russia and Ukraine. You've described Russia itself a couple of times as orthodox. That's central to your understanding of Russia. You said you're orthodox. What does that mean in, for you? You're a Christian leader by your own description. So what effect does that have on you? You know, as I already mentioned in 988, Prince Vladimir himself was baptized following the example of his grandmother, Princess Olga, and then he baptized his squad, and then gradually over the course of several years he baptized all the Rus. It was a lengthy process, from pagans to Christians. It took many years. But in the end, this orthodoxy, Eastern Christianity, deeply rooted itself in the consciousness of the Russian people. 
When Russia expanded and absorbed other nations who profess Islam, Buddhism and Judaism, Russia has always been very loyal to those people who profess other religions. This is her strength. This is absolutely clear. And the fact is that the main postulates, main values are very similar, not to say the same in all world religions I've just mentioned, and which are the traditional religions of the Russian Federation, Russia. By the way, Russian authorities were always very careful about the culture and religion of those people who came into the Russian Empire. This, in my opinion, forms the basis of both security and stability of the Russian statehood. All the peoples inhabiting Russia basically consider it their motherhood. If, say, people move over to you or to Europe from Latin America, an even clearer and more understandable example, people come, but yet they have come to you or to European countries from their historical homeland. And people who profess different religions in Russia consider Russia their motherland. They have no other motherland. We are together, this is one big family, and our traditional values are very similar. I've just mentioned one big family, but everyone has his, her own family. And this is the basis of our society. And if we say that the motherland and the family are specifically connected with each other, it is indeed the case, since it is impossible to ensure a normal future for our children and our families unless we ensure a normal, sustainable future for the entire country, for the motherland. That is why patriotic sentiment is so strong in Russia. No. But can I, can I say that the, the one way in which the religions are different is that Christianity is specifically a nonviolent religion. Jesus says, turn the other cheek, don't kill. How can a leader <laughs> who has to kill of any country, how can a leader be a Christian? How do you reconcile that to yourself? Wow. It is very easy when it comes to protecting oneself and one's family, one's homeland. We won't attack anyone. When did the developments in Ukraine start? Since the coup d'etat and the hostilities in Donbas began, that's when they started. And we're protecting our people, ourselves, our homeland and our future. As for religion in general, you know, it's not about external manifestations. It's not about going to church every day or banging your head on the floor. Was that just a slam against Islam? It is in the heart, and our culture is so human-oriented. Dostoevsky, who was very well known in the West and the genius of Russian culture, Russian literature, spoke a lot about this, about the Russian soul. After all, Western society is more pragmatic. Russian people think more about the eternal, about moral values. I don't know, maybe you won't agree with me, but Western culture is more pragmatic after all. I'm not saying this is bad. It makes it possible for today's golden billion to achieve good success in production, even in science and so on. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that we kind of look the same. But our well, so, minds so are do you see the different. supernatural at work as you look out across what's happening in the world now? Do you see God at work? Do you ever think to yourself, these are forces that are not human? 
Да нет, я, честно говоря, так не думаю. Я думаю о том, что... No, to be honest, I don't think so. My opinion is that the development of the world community is in accordance with the inherent laws, and those laws are what they are. It's always been this way in the history of mankind. Some nations and countries rose, became stronger and more numerous, and then left the international stage, losing the status they had accustomed to. There is probably no need for me to give examples, but we could start with the Genghis Khan and Horde conquerors, the Golden Horde, and then end with the Roman Empire. It seems that there has never been anything like the Roman Empire in the history of mankind. Nevertheless, the potential of the barbarians gradually grew, as did their population. In general, the barbarians were getting stronger and begun to develop economically, as we would say today. This eventually led to the collapse of the Roman Empire and the regime imposed by the Romans. However, it took five centuries for the Roman Empire to fall apart. The difference with what is happening now is that all the processes of change are happening at a much faster pace than in Roman times. So when does the AI empire start, do you think? The AI, I'm not sure if he's talking about uh, artificial intelligence, but I, that might be what he's leading into because Putin's kind of suggesting, hey, because of social media today, everything's moving a lot faster. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ah, all right. <laughs> You're asking increasingly more complicated questions. <laughs> to answer them, you need to be an expert in big numbers, big data, and AI. Mankind is currently facing many threats. Due to the genetic researches, it is now possible to create a superhuman, a specialized human being, a genetically engineered athlete, scientist, military man. There are reports that Elon Musk has already had a chip implanted in the human brain in the USA. <laughs> what do you think of that? Well, I think... Wait, wait, let's be clear. He did implant a chip in someone else's human brain, not in Elon's brain. I haven't heard that part, but I have heard the chip has gone into somebody else's brain. That was a little bit of a, like, potentially a dangling participle there. I think there's no stopping Elon Musk. He will do as he sees fit. <laughs> Nevertheless, you need to find some common ground with him, search for ways to persuade him. I think he's a smart person, I truly believe he is. So you need to reach an agreement with him because this process needs to be formalized and subjected to certain rules. Humanity has to consider what is going to happen due to the newest development in genetics or in AI. One can make an approximate prediction of what will happen. Once mankind felt an existential threat coming from nuclear weapons, all nuclear nations began to come to terms with one another since they realized the negligent use of nuclear weaponry could drive humanity to extinction. It is impossible to stop research in genetics or AI today, just as it was impossible to stop the use of gunpowder back in the day. But as soon as we realize that the threat comes from unbridled and uncontrolled development of AI, or genetics, or any other field, the time will come to reach an international agreement on how to regulate these things. I, I appreciate all the time uh, you've given us. I just got to ask you one last question, and that's about someone who's very famous in the United States, probably not here, Evan Gershkovitz, who's the Wall Street Journal reporter. He's 32. It's um, smart. And he's been in prison for almost a year. Smart, uh, this Tucker. This is a huge story in the United States. And I just want to ask you directly, without getting into the details of it or your version of what happened, if as a sign of your decency, 
you would be willing to release him to us and we'll bring him back to the United States. So smart. Мы столько сделали жестов доброй воли, что мне кажется, мы исчерпали все линии. We have done so many gestures of good will out of decency that I think we have run out of them. Ни разу не ответил. Но we have never seen anyone reciprocate to us in a similar manner. Что мы However, in theory, we can say that we do not rule out that we can do that. Исключаем if our partners take reciprocal steps. When I talk about the partners, I, first of all, refer to special services. Special services are in contact with one another. They are talking about the matter in question. There is no taboo to settle this issue. We are willing to solve it. But there are certain terms being discussed via special services channels. I believe an agreement can be reached. So typically, I mean, this stuff has happened for obviously centuries. One Quickly, that was really smart of Tucker. Either he wins the release, which then he's a national hero, Tucker, or at least he tried and now everybody in the mainstream media is like damn that was a class act that was really smart by tucker brilliant one country catches another spy within its borders it trades it for one of its own intel guys in another country i think what makes <coughs> it and it's not my business but what makes this difference is the guy's obviously not a spy he's a kid and maybe he was breaking your law in some way, but he's not a super spy and everybody knows that. And he's being held hostage in exchange, which is true with respect. It's true and everyone knows it's true. So maybe he's in a different category. Maybe it's not fair to ask for, you know, somebody else in exchange for letting him out. Maybe it degrades Russia to do that. You know, you can give different interpretations to what constitutes a spy, but there are certain things provided by law. If a person gets secret information and does that in a conspiratorial manner, then this is a qualified as espionage. And that is exactly what he was doing. He was receiving classified confidential information and he did it covertly. Maybe he did that out of carelessness or his own initiative. Considering the sheer fact this is qualified as espionage, the fact has been proven as he was caught red-handed when he was receiving this information. If it had been some far-fetched excuse, some fabrication, something not proven, it would have been a different story then. But he was caught red-handed when he was secretly getting confidential information. What is it then? But are you suggesting that he was working for the US government or NATO, or he was just a reporter who was given material he wasn't supposed to have? Those seem like very different, very different things. I don't know who he was working for, but I would like to reiterate that getting classified information in secret is called espionage, and he was working for the U.S. Special Services, some other agencies. I don't think he was working for Monaco, as Monaco is hardly interested in getting that information. It is up to special services to come to an agreement. Some groundwork has been laid. There are people who, in our view, are not connected with special services. Let me tell you a story about a person serving a sentence in an allied country of the US. That person, due to patriotic sentiments, eliminated a bandit in one of the European capitals. During the events in the Caucasus, do you know what he was doing? I don't want to say that, but I will do it anyway. He was laying our soldiers, taken prisoner, on the road and then drove his car over their heads. What kind of person is that? Can he even be called human? But there was a patriot who eliminated him in one of the European capitals. 
Whether he did it of his own volition or not, that is a different question. Yeah, but Evan, what don't, what don't, what don't that. I mean, that's a completely different. I mean, I mean, this is a 32-year-old like newspaper. He committed something different. He's not just a journalist. I reiterate, he's a journalist who was secretly getting confidential information. Yes, it is different, but still, I'm talking about other people who are essentially controlled by the U.S. authorities, wherever they are serving a sentence. There is an ongoing dialogue between the special services. This has to be resolved in a calm, responsible and professional manner. I think it's so interesting how much pushback Putin is actually giving here. He's really trying to uh, explain. You know, Putin could have easily said, hey, we're negotiating that and cut that story. But Putin's actually going deep into this. Hey, this person violated our laws. This person committed espionage. This person went way deeper than you think, and we caught him red-handed. And what, what that does now is it creates some doubt in people who are hearing the story only from an American point of view. That's the point of, of Putin sort of speaking, is now you hear the other side. It's like, okay, well, well who is right? Very interesting. They're keeping in touch, so let them do their work. I do not rule out that the person you refer to, Mr. Gershkovitz, may return to his motherland. By the end of the day, it does not make any sense to keep him in prison in Russia. Wait, wait, wait. Tucker never... Did Tucker actually mention Evan's name? Because Putin ruled that off pretty smoothly. He knows exactly who this person is. We want the U.S. Special Services to think about how they can contribute to achieving the goals our Special Services are pursuing. We are ready to talk. Moreover, the talks are on their way. And there have been many successful examples of these talks crowned with success. Probably this is going to be crowned with success as well. But we have to come to an agreement. I hope you let him out. Mr. President, thank you. <laughs> I also want him to return to his homeland at last. I'm absolutely sincere. But let me say once again, the dialogue continues. The more public we render things of this nature, the more difficult it becomes to resolve them. Everything has to be done in calm manner. I wonder if that's I wonder if that's, that's true with the, with the war, though. Also, I mean, I just want to. I guess I want to ask one more question, which is, <laughs> and maybe you don't want to say so for strategic reasons, but are you worried that what's happening in Ukraine could lead to something much larger and much more horrible? And how motivated are you just to call the U.S. government and say, "Let's come to terms"? I already said that we did not refuse to talk. We're sure, but you already <laughs> said it. I didn't think you meant it as an insult because you already said correctly, it's been reported that Ukraine was prevented from negotiating a peace settlement by the former British Prime Minister acting on behalf of the Biden administration. So of course there are satellite, big countries control small countries, that's not new. And that's why I asked about dealing directly with the Biden administration, which is making these decisions, not President Zelensky of Ukraine. Well, if the Zelensky administration in Ukraine refused to negotiate, I assume they did it under the instruction from Washington. If Washington believes it to be the wrong decision, let it abandon it. Let it find a delicate excuse so that no one is insulted. Let it come up with a way out. It was not us who made this decision, it was them. So let them go back on it, that is it. However, they made the wrong decision and now we have to look for a way out of the situation to correct their mistakes. They did it, so let them correct it themselves. We support this. So I just want to make sure I'm not misunderstanding what you're saying. I don't think that I am. I think you're saying you want a negotiated settlement to what's happening in Ukraine. Right. And we made it. 
We prepared a huge document in Istanbul that was initialed by the head of the Ukrainian delegation. He affixed his signature to some of the provisions, not to all of it. He put his signature and then he himself said, we were ready to sign it and the war would have been over long ago, 18 months ago. However, Prime Minister Johnson came, talked us out of it, and we missed that chance. Well, you missed it, you made a mistake, let them get back to that, that is all. Why do we have to bother ourselves and correct somebody else's mistakes? I know one can say it is our mistake. It was us who intensified the situation and decided to put an end to the war that started in 2014 in Donbas. As I have already said, by means of weapons. Let me get back to furthering history. I already told you this. We were just discussing it. Let it is pointless though, isn't it? We may go back and forth endlessly, but they stop negotiations. Is it a mistake? Yes. Correct it. We are ready. What else is needed? Do you think it's too humiliating at this point for NATO to accept Russian control of what was two years ago Ukrainian territory? I said, uh, let them think how to do it with dignity. There are options if there is a will. Up until now, there has been the uproar and screaming about inflicting a strategic defeat on Russia on the battlefield. Now they are apparently coming to realize that it is difficult to achieve, if possible at all. In my opinion, it is impossible by definition, it is never going to happen. It seems to me that now, those who are in power in the West have come to realize this as well. If so, if the realization has set in, they have to think what to do next. We are ready for this dialogue. Would you be willing to say, congratulations NATO, you won, and just keep the situation where it is now? You know, it is a subject matter for the negotiations. No one is willing to conduct or, to put it more accurately, they are willing but do not know how to do it. I know they want to. It. it is not just I see it, but I know they do want it. But they are struggling to understand how to do it. They have driven the situation to the point where we are at. It is not us who have done that, it is our partners, opponents, who have done that. Well, now let them think how to reverse the situation. We're not against it. It would be funny if it were not so sad. This endless mobilization in Ukraine, the hysteria, the domestic problems, sooner or later it will result in agreement. You know, this probably sounds strange given the current situation. But the relations between the two peoples will be rebuilt anyway. It will take a lot of time, but they will heal. I'll give you very unusual examples. There is a combat encounter on the battlefield. Here is a specific example. Ukrainian soldiers got encircled. This is an example from real life. Our soldiers were shouting to them, there is no chance, surrender yourselves, come out and you will be alive. Suddenly the Ukrainian soldiers were screaming from there in Russian, perfect Russian saying, Russians do not surrender, and all of them perished. They still identify themselves as Russian. What is happening is, to a certain extent, an element of a civil war. Everyone in the West thinks that the Russian people have been split by hostilities forever. No. They will be reunited. The unity is still there. 
Why are the Ukrainian authorities dismantling the Ukrainian Orthodox Church? Because it brings together not only the territory, it brings together our souls. No one will be able to separate the soul. Shall we end here or is there anything else? No, I think that's great. Thank you, Mr. President. Wow. Wow. Okay. First of all, thank you so much for being here. Make sure to subscribe if you want more breakdowns. I'm about to run through everything that was just talked about in about 15 minutes. So if you like what I do on the channel, hit subscribe, join me for uh, politically neutral breakdowns of what the hell is going on in our world because there's a whole lot of crazy stuff going on in the world. All right, ready? Let's see how fast we can do this. Tucker Carlson just had a historic sit-down interview with Vladimir Putin, president of Russia. Here's everything that you need to know, a full summary of everything that happened as quickly as we can get through it. First, Tucker starts by asking, why do you think the U.S. might strike Russia? Putin then goes into a history of the invasions of the Russian state, referring to Mongol invasions as the Horde. And we sped all the way from the 900s to the 1400s to the 2000s. Tucker asked multiple times, why is this relevant today? And Vladimir Putin made it very clear that he wanted to see the slow dismantling of Russia, the pressure of Russia from all angles, which essentially culminated in the war against Ukraine today. See, Vladimir Putin also distanced himself multiple times from the past. He distanced himself from Lenin permitting Ukraine from, uh, from, from leaving the USSR and becoming Ukraine, allowing the Bolsheviks to establish their independence in Ukraine. He distanced himself from that. He distanced himself heavily and multiple times from what he calls the Nazification. We'll talk a lot about that in this of society. And he makes it very clear that he would have made different decisions and that he has one vision for Putin and uh, for Russia. And that vision is unity. But unfortunately, he's essentially watched over not only history, but his lifetime as the Russian, either USSR or the Soviet Union has collapsed. And every time there has been a collapse, he thought, well, maybe Russia will finally be able to negotiate a generous and uh, beneficial relationship with other organizations or countries. He specifically points out the 1991 Soviet Union collapse, where Russia generously bestowed, those are his words, Ukraine to other parts of the world. And the collapse of the Soviet Union was led by poor Russian leaders, but now those leaders are gone. We can expect cooperation. In fact, there were even people like Egon Barr of the German SDP, the Social Democratic Party, uh, where a new system could be established without expanding NATO. and There could be some kind of alliance. And so Putin really distanced himself from what happened and ideas that could have been. Barr's ideas, a new system outside of NATO, was something that could have been. But those things didn't happen. So this is where things get interesting. Putin talks essentially about how NATO expanded five times. And this expansion is pressure. Pressure on Russia. This is on ehack.com where I have a full summary of the entire interview, but here you could see a chart that shows you the expansion of NATO towards Russian territory. Vladimir Putin says he's not bitter, that this is not about resentment. This is instead about the expanding power of NATO, which ultimately culminated in 2014. Now we'll touch on 2014 in just a moment, but first consider the partnership that Vladimir Putin and George Bush almost had. In August of 2007, Vladimir Putin made a counteroffer to George Bush on a planned U.S. missile shield defense system, a joint missile defense program. Bush himself and I have my sources on this at ehack.com, called this a very innovative plan. This was true. We fact-checked this during the time of the interview. Putin suggested we can drastically change the world if we work together. But then somehow the president's underlings essentially contributed to the deal falling apart. Vladimir Putin is basically alleging here that Putin and him were good friends, or, or got along at least. And that it's the system of America that wants to keep Russia an enemy. And it's that pressure that oppresses Russia. 
the deal fell apart, so Putin says we had to go develop our own missiles, our own hypersonic missiles. He argues things got worse when in 2008, the United States backed separatists. Background on this, okay, in 2008, Kosovo decided to declare independence from Serbia. Serbia was being supported by Russia. Kosovo was being supported by the United States. And at a NATO summit in Bucharest, the United States gave Ukraine and Georgia, the country, not the state, a membership action plan to join NATO. That obviously pisses Putin off. Putin says, what's going on? Ukraine is supposed to be a neutral state. Why weapons? Why NATO? This is not what we agreed to. And then we get into this slow growing support for the West. Between 2005 and 2010, you have Viktor Yushchenko who supports the West, but then that flips into another president, the fourth president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, who was president from 2010 to 2014. He was considered, or at one point was considering open borders with the European Union. And Vladimir Putin's like, what is this? We don't want you to have open borders with the European Union because if you do, that is going to lead to a free flow of goods between you and that is going to hurt our free market economy. So we would have to close our border. At some point, things got tense. Viktor Yanukovych said, fine, I will support Russia. And as soon as he flips to support Russia, boom, coup d'etat. That is a military overthrow of the presidency. Vladimir Putin alleges that this was backed by the CIA. He actually goes as far as slamming Tucker Carlson for wanting to join the CIA and then suggests it was probably a good thing that Tucker Carlson got denied. That was really sly. Tucker's face at that point was kind of like, bro, you went there. <laughs> that was pretty crazy. But anyway, Vladimir Putin then says, look, we took Crimea in exchange under our protection. Okay, now obviously that's not how the West calls it. The West says Russian forces occupied Crimea to quell protests. And then the Russian government organized, illegally is what the West alleges, the Republic of Crimea. And when the Republic of Crimea was formed, then the Republic declared independence from Ukraine and Russia annexed Crimea. That's sort of their story, okay? Many countries today still see Crimea as Ukrainian. Anyway, and this is also a very strategically important location with the seaport, Sevastopol. We, we don't have to go into all of that. It's important, okay? Strategically, critically, everything important. So it's kind of convenient. But anyway, Putin suggests that the U.S. backed the coup that caused this. In 2014, we then had war breakout in, Don, in the Donbass region. Uh, this was another phase in the Russia-Ukrainian war that came after this Crimean takeover. It started April 12th of 2014. 14,000 were killed. Uh, that, uh, that was about um, 6,500 Russians, 4,400 Ukrainians, 3,400 civilians. So there have been tensions and issues here for a while. Vladimir Putin said... He's been asking for decades, please keep weapons out of Ukraine. We want peace. In fact, we're going to offer peace and, a peace and come up with the Minsk agreements that were negotiated and settled. This was the settlement that relaxed uh, uh, tensions in Donbass and ended that war. However, Vladimir Putin suggests that Zelensky, Volodymyr Zelensky, refuses to implement the Minsk Accords. Now, Ukraine has responded to this allegation. I'm in interjecting this. Ukraine has responded to those allegations and says Ukraine has always been committed to implementing Minsk. It's actually Russia who's not implementing the plan, and they're trying to make it worse by sowing instability by not implementing the plan. Putin then immediately after, I take a little pause and suggest that Ukraine is complaining that Russia is not implementing the plan. Immediately after, Putin literally says, we were ready to implement it. Okay, he didn't actually say it that way because he says it through a translator, but he did literally say, we were ready to implement it, which it kind of means he didn't implement it. So it kind of means Ukraine was right about that. So I'm like, wait a minute, so, so you didn't implement it? There were a couple instances like this through the interview where Putin's kind of like pooped on himself a little bit, but some of the things he said were actually very interesting. So let's keep going. 
Uh, he says that, I believe if we manage to bring the residents of Donbass back to Ukraine, these wounds would heal. This is a common theme of what Putin says. He actually thinks everybody's sort of just one person, that the Ukrainian people are actually Russians at heart. Uh, now, of course, there have been studies by, for example, Pew Research that suggest Polish individuals don't like Russia, but the Ukrainians, you have a lot more of a mix. You know, they say 94% of Polish individuals don't like Russia or don't support Russia. But in Ukraine, this picture is much more uh, uh, mixed. Now, why is this not over yet? When will the war end? Putin suggests we have to complete the denazification of Ukraine. He talks about how this was discussed in Istanbul and he also talks about how he pulled out of Kiev, his military out of Kiev, uh, as a Kiev, Kiev, whatever, as a way to negotiate. But wait a minute. Western point of view here says that Ukraine pushed Russia out. Russia's point of view is, no, we left as part of the negotiations. Tucker then talks denazification. Putin talks this is very important. It's worth noting that Ukraine does have a history of collaborating with Hitler. Of course, okay? There was a lot of history between Hitler, World War I, World War II, Germany, okay, uh, to this territory. Of course, there's a lot of history there. And yes, Zelensky is Jewish. Yes, 56 to 140,000 Jews live in Ukraine. And yes, there are hi Ukrainian historical figures that have monuments that have ties to Hitler. Now, the greatest modern day of Nazification that Putin alleges that, uh, uh, that, that basically the world supports is that Zelensky visited Canada's parliament and someone named Yaroslav Hunka, a 98-year-old former Nazi, gave a speech in parliament. That individual worked for a part of the Nazi party known as the Waffenschutzstaffel. The SS, this is one of the elite forces within the Nazi party, within the Nazi military wing. W w Waffen means weapon, okay? So the, the weapon SS, Schutzstaffel. Anyway, this occurred September 22nd of 2023, just a few months ago. This actually happened. What made it worse, though, was not just that that person spoke in the Canadian parliament, which is now being referred to as a big scandal. But what made it worse was the perception, and this did actually happen, that everybody gave this individual a two-time standing ovation. <sighs> okay, Putin then argues that he hasn't spoken with Biden since prior to his special military operation. Tucker says, why don't you just call Biden and work this out? Putin says, what's there to work out? Okay, this is very important. I, 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 this, like, if there's anything y'all pay attention to, this line right here is very, very important. Subscribe. Okay, I had to do that. I'm sorry. No, what's actually, this is actually very important about what Putin said. Putin said, if you want, and this is his point of view of negotiating. This becomes very relevant in a moment. Putin says, if you want to stop fighting, stop supplying weapons, then it will be over in a few weeks. Then we can negotiate. Okay, okay, okay. Well, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Putin. Well, I gotta throw an interjection in here. You just said, we are willing to negotiate, but then you say, we'll negotiate after you stop giving weapons, after you stop fighting, then it will be over in a few weeks. In other words, you'll mop up what you need to, and then we can negotiate. Obviously, the United States is like, bro, then we have no leg to stand on in a negotiation. Ukraine as well, European Union and otherwise, right? I want you to keep in mind Putin's version of negotiating. This becomes very important in just a moment. Anyway, Tucker says, is NATO worried? Putin says, well, that's what they're saying. You know, NATO and the United States are trying to paint this picture that we are going to cause some kind of nuclear war. We're going to use strategic nuclear weapons. That would be stupid. We are not going to invade any other territory unless they attack us. We would only send troops to Poland if they attack us. It's absolutely out of the question. It goes against common sense to create some kind of global war because that would be bad for humanity. This is just how the West tries to extort more money from their taxpayers. American mercenaries, Polish mercenaries should not be in Ukraine. If they brought troops, this would be a global conflict. That's Putin's argument. He's not wrong. There has been a lot of warmongering. He is not wrong about that. But you're ready for Putin's slam on America? This was intense. 
Why is America so focused on the on, on Ukraine? You have issues with the border. You have issues with the national debt. You have $33 trillion in debt. You have migrant issues at the border. Have you nothing better to do? Wouldn't it be better to just negotiate with Russia and return to common sense and respect our country? Mic drop there. That was a banger, okay? Putin hit where it hurts. Democrats and Republicans can agree on that. That hurt. Tucker then says, who blew up the Nord Stream pipeline? Putin obviously says, you did. Tucker says, do you have evidence? And Putin says, ah, look, you just have to connect the dots. Who is capable of blowing up a pipeline at the bottom of the Baltic Sea? And who is interested? And he basically implies that that's the United States. Putin says it's very hard to win in the war of propaganda because the United States controls the media. In fairness and side note, what we saw with the Twitter files kind of says there's some truth to that. Anyway, Putin then goes on to say that there is another Nord Stream pipeline that can be used. Fact check, this is also true. Four pipelines exist. Nord Stream Pipeline 1, AB. Nord Stream Pipeline 2, AB. Pipe A of the Nord Stream 2 is inoperable. Pipe B is undamaged. And the Nord Stream 1 is offline. Damage. Putin then gets into the de-dollarization of the United States. He talks about, essentially, the United States using the dollar as a weapon, and this being the biggest mistake of U.S. political leadership. The dollar is a cornerstone of U.S. power, and by weaponizing it, you are weakening it. Okay, side note here. Yes, the dollar will never stop being printed by the Federal Reserve and essentially the U.S. government to strengthen whatever desires the U.S. government has. Yes, we will keep printing money, we will keep having inflation, and for as long as possible, we will be the world's reserve currency until we become the, you know, until there's basically a better option. Maybe that's Bitcoin, maybe that's BRICS. BRICS is uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Maybe they could create another common currency. Uh, Tucker here asks, hey, well, what if BRICS is then dominated by the Chinese? Putin responds to this and says, uh, we've heard these boogeyman stories before. We're neighbors with China. You can't choose your neighbors just like you can't choose your relatives. We share a border of a thousand kilometers. We have a centuries-long policy of partnership. China seeks compromise. We can compromise as well. We can work with China. It's very interesting. Putin here is drawing a parallel. He's basically saying, look, we work with China. Why can't we work with the United States? Putin is not wrong, though, about the U.S. having a massive advantage of the money printer. This is why on this channel, I regularly talk finance and how it's important for you to get your money, your cash, into assets. Ownership in business, ownership in real estate. That's how you insulate yourself from inflation and the destruction of the dollar. I don't really care what assets you buy. You just have to get into assets that aren't dollars. Anyway, okay, continuing with the topic. So... Putin says the United States should actually cooperate more with China. Now, Putin also alleges that the United, States, uh, United Nations is an illegitimate body. The USSR joined the United Nations in 1945, the Soviet Union in 1991, and it's worth noting that the US tried to kick Russia out of the UN, but they weren't able to. Now, a lot of people wonder, why is Russia still in the United Nations? Okay, well, remember, Russia is a P5 member of the United Nations Security Council. P5 means permanent five. Who are the P5? China, France, Russia, United Kingdom, United States. Each have full veto power. That's why Russia stays in the United Nations. They stay in because they have power. Full veto power. One veto can overturn whatever the UN Security Council wants to do. Now, China would probably ally with Russia anyway, but Russia doesn't want to give away its power. Vladimir Putin then gets into praising Bush and, frankly, Trump. He said just that he had a relationship with Bush and Trump, that these were not country bumpkins, well, Bush wasn't a country bumpkin, that instead, none of these people are worse than any other politician. They know what they're doing. We had a relationship with them. It's not about Demeter. It's about the goal. Are you going to adapt or are you trying to dominate? Tucker then asks, implying that Biden is trying to dominate by in instantly going to Biden. Tucker then suggests, well, who's actually running the United States? And Putin says, I have no idea. It's not possible to know. This is a slam here clearly on Biden. It's a slam on Biden, which there's plenty going on with Biden. It's a slam on Biden to suggest that 
Biden's not actually running America right now, that the underlings in the Biden administration are the ones actually running the country, potentially led by people on boards at like Lockheed Martin or Boeing or whatever, who are supporting the military industrial complex. I don't know. Those are allegations, obviously, from some. Not everybody agrees with that. The flip side says, whoa, 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 we're just spending money where we think it will defend American lives. Okay? Everybody has to make their own conclusion on that. Anyway, Vladimir Putin gets into how we're, he's constantly pressured from all sides. NATO expanding and the supplying of weapons is unacceptable. And ultimately, we need to have a negotiated solution. He suggests that he is willing to negotiate and he dodges the question of if he would be satisfied with the territory that he has now. It might not necessarily have been a dodge, though. It might be because he just wants less pressure on Russia. He suggests that he's just protecting ourselves. He's protecting the Russian motherland. He then gets into talking about how ultimately he thinks the Russians and Ukrainians uh, will be united, that there will be a solution eventually, and that religion will bring everyone together. That religion is in your heart. It's not about banging your head against the ground. It's about what's in your heart. It's also, Putin mentions this, important to question, why would Orthodox churches be shut down in Ukraine? This is where Putin is basically trying to salt the uh, uh, Ukrainian defense to argue like, wait, do they actually want to unify? Are they actually sincere in their negotiations? When Vladimir Putin is asked by Tucker Carlson, hey, well, what's it going to take to negotiate? Putin kind of gives up here. Putin says, look, we tried to negotiate. We initialed many parts of a deal in Istanbul. We withdrew from Kiev. We've tried to negotiate. But Boris Johnson came in and tore up the negotiated plan and told Russia uh, or told Ukraine not to sign the deal. We almost had a deal 18 months ago, and now it's evaporated. Who is supporting this? Is it the US? Is it the United Kingdom? We've been willing to negotiate. When you're ready to negotiate, you come to us. That's how Putin left off with negotiate. Now, to be clear, remember how I told you to remember something very important earlier when I told you to subscribe, okay? Putin says, you come to us when you're ready to negotiate. But Putin also said, in order to negotiate with me, you all have to stop fighting, stop supplying weapons, and after a few weeks, after we end this, presumably mop everything up, then we'll negotiate. So I kind of got two Putins there. I got the Putin that's like, yeah, I'm ready to negotiate. Come anytime, I'm ready. And then I got, I'm not ready to negotiate unless you basically lose. Ah, <sighs> okay, all right. Anyway, there was a little bit of talk about Elon Musk, about how Elon is a very smart man, that, uh, you know, Putin heard he just implanted a chip into some person's brain, and that genetics and AI are all going to be really big risks in the future. They'll probably be regulated just like nuclear weapons were, because once people realize there are threats to their own humanity, they end up regulating it. Just like they did with nukes, they'll end up doing with genetic engineering, and they'll end up doing with AI. Now, Tucker Carlson pulled a really 4D chess move towards the end of the interview. He said, will you release the jailed Wall Street Journal reporter? This was brilliant for two reasons. Number one, if he got the reporter released, Tucker Carlson would be a national hero. hero. Number two, even if he didn't get the reporter released, he tried, and he tried hard. That is a way of warming up the mainstream media to like Tucker Carlson, because the mainstream media does not want to see one of their reporters in jail in Russia. It's a 33-year-old named Evan. He worked for the Wall Street Journal. He still works for the Wall Street Journal, theoretically. Presumably. Anyway. Vladimir Putin says this individual was not just a reporter. They conducted espionage. We caught the individual red handed and we'll probably come up with some kind of solution and it'll be win win for everybody. But we're not there yet. OK, there you go. That is a complete summary of everything that happened in this interview between Tucker Carlson and Vladimir Putin. If you like this, please consider subscribing. I do breakdowns like this regularly. I go live every morning. The stock market is open on the stock market open live stream channel. Just type into YouTube, meet Kevin stock market open. There'll also be a redirect link at the end of this live stream. And I do breaking news and I cover topics like what happened at the Supreme Court today. I covered all of that in detail. I talk stocks, real estate, finance, you name it. Thank you so much for being here. Keep in mind, I also covered the J6 live stream straight for like 10 or 12 hours. That was crazy. But I never had 150,000 concurrent viewers. Thank you for choosing to come here. Appreciate y'all. We'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.